Okay, good evening. Welcome to the November 17th, 2015 Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals. Could we have a call order? Mr. Lizzo? Here. Ebert? Present. Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Crockett? Here. Mr. Stark? Here. And Mr. Richard? Here. Fantastic. Uh, the uh, approval of the minutes of October 14th, do I have a motion? Move Mot to approve as uh, submitted. Seconded. Second the other one. Great. Any discussion on the motion? Yes. No, no, I was just voting. Okay. Uh, All in favor? <laughs> it's unanimous. Thank you very much. And then we'll roll uh, right into the. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Pledge of allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Nice to live in a country where the rule of ours still seems to matter. Um, let's start with appeal number 2545. It's an approval. Uh, it's approved May 13, 2015, variance extension request by Warren Kristen uh, Valdemanis, 27 Ashton Street. This is map U2, parcel 25. Anything to add on this one? Yes, this was a, uh, an approval from May 13, 2015. Um, uh, for a variance appeal that was um, approved at that date and basically they're just coming back because of um, work um, related uh, scheduling issues they're asking for the uh, or requesting a six-month extension which pursuant to section 4k uh, all permits and approvals issued pursuant to this ordinance shall expire if construction of the building or structure or commencement of the use has not begun within six months of the date on which the permit or approval was issued upon good cause the person or board issuing the original permit or approval may extend its effectiveness for an additional six months thank you uh any changes or any add-ons or subtractions no, it's exactly the same. the same okay mr wilson you're representing the uh, applicant yes i am uh, if it please the board i would suggest that we just vote to extend rather than going through details based on the fact that nothing has changed i just want to confirm that with mr wilson no changes whatsoever no changes whatsoever you just said because of just because of timing and coups and well he got he had a was this guy that had to go away he had to go to hong kong for six months okay. he's due back you know early spring okay great all right uh so if the, everybody's comfortable with that i accept the motion make a motion to uh, approve appeal 2545 as presented for the extension second any discussion on the motion uh, just one thing before we vote we have uh the long staff has been working with the town to be able to change the way that we do this ordinance as we, we talked about changing the rules so the ordinance is good the uh, approval is good for one year with no extension option it hasn't gone through yet but it's on the table just to let you know and uh, I think it makes more sense we've both looked at it and the board has looked at it whether or not the council will take action on it it's unknown but right now still the rule is this I think it makes a lot of sense yeah, because a lot of the times that come in front of the board, we have to time it as to when they're going to start. And we have to weather get, and yeah, so we come to the board in such a time frame that they'll be able to start it in the fall. And so a lot of times I don't get to the board until late spring or early summer, even midsummer, in order to start in the fall. But if I knew we had a year, I could come in earlier, maybe when it's not quite so busy doing doing things, and get it yeah. for a year and still fit the time frame. We didn't even think of that reality. Good yeah. point. Yeah. Okay. So do I have a vote? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good point. Appreciate it, Mr. Wilson. It's appeal number twenty-five-sixty-three. It's a practical difficulty variance. Uh, Request by uh, Stephanie Don Davis, it's 384 Gorham Road, Assessor's Map, R19, Parcel 8. Do we have representatives? Okay, let's take the microphone, state your name and address, and we'll go from there. Absolutely. If you do, would you please use the handheld microphone so that you can be heard? Yes, sir. I'm to have to turn it on. It'll have to be turned on. Okay. <coughs> You may have to turn that on. There's a little switch on it. I can I can use this microphone. I just uh, needed a second to prop this up. Okay. If you want to pull that microphone down a little bit, just introduce yourself and uh, your address, please. Hi, my name is Stephanie Davis. I live at 384 Gorham Road. And 
if you'd like to explain what your uh, Okay. Um, so I am requesting a practical difficulty variant. Um, I'm requesting a 15 foot setback reduction from the 50 feet uh, currently on the side street of Sweetbriar um, to go from 50 feet to 35 feet in order to build an accessory dwelling unit. Um, Recent changes in my parents' circumstances, uh, both health and mobility, have presented me with the immediate need to accommodate them with a dwelling on my property. While the situation has evolved quickly, my request has been very carefully thought out. I have considered multiple possible living options, and the only practical and viable option is to build an accessory dwelling unit. In accordance with the regulations, it will be in the style of a small carriage house uh, with 704 square feet of living space. I've met all the criteria for the accessory dwelling unit apart from the location on my lot due to the setbacks. I'm seeking a 15 foot reduction from the current 50 foot setback on Sweetbriar Lane, a side street, for a distance of 34 feet. The variance is needed due to the fact that it is neither practical nor feasible to build this dwelling on any other location on my property while adhering to other coding restrictions. In the information that follows, I will communicate why my request meets the criteria for this variance. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, before we start, any board questions? This is a uh, practical difficulty variance. And we do have a letter, but I'll read that in, in a moment. Uh, with that page. <coughs> any questions for any of the board members? Possibly after uh, after we heard her. Proposal. Okay. Well, seeing none, let's go through the process. Just going to get to that page. Mike, unless I've ordered everything in the approximate order um, at the application, um, so we can, if you would like me to start with the criteria, we can just flip to tab number one. Sure. That okay. would be fine. Okay, so the first criteria, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. The variance is needed due to the unique shape, frontage, and corner location of my lot. The location of my lot is on the corner of Gorham Road and Sweetbriar Lane. My property has 156.9 feet of frontage on Gorham Road with setbacks imposed on Sweetbriar Lane reducing the buildable width to 91.1 feet. The property extends 594 feet down Sweetbriar Lane, thus making it a very long and narrow lot. Other properties in the area have a more square lot, allowing more room to work within the setbacks. Those properties that are similar in shape to mine are not on a corner, which allows them to have a 15-foot setback on their sides rather than the 50-foot setback that restricts me. Thus, the unique combination of my lot shape and the fact that it is to consider to have two frontage roads basically renders 49% or 44,000 square feet, which is over an acre of my property unbuildable. In addition to um, those setbacks, uh, in accordance with the accessory dwelling unit application, um, I have to build the entire uh, accessory dwelling unit within a 100-foot radius, uh, which um, eliminates roughly 34,000 additional square feet. Good. And so this... Um, I'm going to be referring to this uh, for quite a lot of uh, the criteria questions. Um, and what I've done here is gotten my boundary survey. Everything that's in yellow um, are the standard setbacks. Everything that's in blue uh, is what is excluded for the 100-foot rule for the accessory dwelling unit. And the pink is where I'm requesting the variance. And then if you'll see, uh, if you'll flip over to the next page, um, it's the highlighted pink and yellow. Um, this is just an example to show the other lots in my area. Um, so mine is highlighted yellow. I've got uh, Gorham Road, which on our presentation here, they labeled it County Road, uh, which is Gorham Road, also known as 114. So highlighted in pink 114 and, and my side street, Sweetbriar, as well as the, the adjacent um, side street. So if you'll notice, for instance, uh, lots three, four, five, um, they are both skinny, for lack of a better word. 
um, small amount of frontage, but you'll notice they're not on a corner lot, um, so they could have the 15-foot setbacks on either side. If you go down to the next um, street, which is Tamarick, I believe, um, both of those corner lots have over 300, 330 square feet um, as their frontage. Um, so once again, that's just to point out that mine uh, has a unique circumstance of being the long and skinny lot um, with having small frontage. Um, and when you add the setbacks from Gorham Road as being 50 feet, as well as all the way down Sweetbriar, it takes away quite a, a large portion of my buildable area. And why don't we jump to the next one? If the granting of variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood, and not, will not have any unreasonably detrimental effects on either the use of the fair market value of abutting property. Okay. The variance will not produce any undesirable change in the neighborhood. In fact, there was an existing additional dwelling on the property in the same location as the one I am proposing. However, it was on the property line of Sweetbriar. Um, the next page I'll show you the supporting evidence. Um, the proposed dwelling will have no effects on the use of the abutting property and will have no detrimental effects on the fair market value of the abutters. And so if you'll notice on the next page, this is um, an older septic design. That's uh, one of the few documents that I could find with both existing dwellings. Um, I do have, uh, at the end of the presentation, if you're interested, uh, sort of a history of, of my property. Um, there were two dwellings. One of them was um, destroyed by a fire, and the other one was knocked down. Um, so the orientation is a bit different. The solid highlighted blue is my house, um, so Gorham Road uh, would be directly perpendicular to that on the right side of your page. The little blue uh, dotted highlights are the um, original second dwelling, um, although, as I said, it was directly on uh, my setback. I can still actually see the foundation that's right on the property line. So what I'm proposing to do is to put it in the same general location, but move it in 35 feet from where they originally had it. Okay. And, and the next one is the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant yep. or a prior owner. Before we go on, could I um, <laughs> address, I have a couple of additional um, statements here. Um, I do have, and I, I'm not sure how interested you are in looking at the pictures, um, but I wanted to comment on the overall character of the neighborhood, uh, which the question also addresses. Why don't, um, we, do, why don't we do this? Why don't we keep okay. it to the flow of this okay. and then keep those notes because they may be needed. Okay. And uh, it's one of the items, I think, as we go along. And, and other board members will have a lot of questions. <coughs> okay. Okay? <coughs> so if uh, the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Okay, so the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by myself or any prior owners. The practical difficulty is the result of the shape of the lot as well as the 50-foot setbacks on two sides of the property. Um, and I had spoken to one of my neighbors, uh, the neighbor directly across from Sweetbriar, um, who's been there over 20 years, and he does remember when they put the road in and did the subdivision. Um, so I've narrowed it down to that, as well as the person that did um, my boundary survey, I noticed that it, it says it was recorded in the subdivision in 1999. So um, I, to the best of my knowledge, that was when uh, the new setbacks occurred. Okay. And the granting of the variance will not result in, oh, I'm sorry, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Which tab are you on, please? Yes, good point. Yep. Yeah, Hold over one. Yeah, Sorry. Go to tab four, please. Yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, there's no other feasible alternative except the variance uh, available to the applicant. Okay. There is no feasible alternative to the placement of the dwelling. I've mm -hmm. pursued all other locations. Due to the fact that for the accessory dwelling unit to comply with regulations, it must be within 100 feet of my existing house, there are limited possibilities. Due to the setbacks on Gorham Road, it cannot be located in the front of my yard, nor would this be practical or feasible. While there is only a 15-foot setback to my westerly abutter, I cannot place the house on that side due to the location of the septic tank, septic pump, uh, et cetera. The only feasible spot to put, to put it is in the natural clearing near the original location of the accessory dwelling, which would not risk damage to my ex existing septic system. Placing the dwelling in this location will allow for emergency vehicles and snow plows as well as access for heavy equipment should the need arise to repair or maintain my well septic system and leach field. 
Okay, thank you. And then we'll go to uh, the granting of the variance will uh, result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Okay. The granting of this variance would result in bringing my property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. While my neighbors do not necessarily have accessory dwelling units, it is customary to have any additional structures, barns, sheds, or garages at the end of the driveways. With this in mind, we design the dwelling in the style of a carriage house to be in keeping with the surrounding properties. And if you'll flip to the next page, uh, what I've done is sort of narrow down my neighborhood a bit. Again, my house is, or my property is highlighted in yellow. Um, the numbers that are circled in pink are the, the following pictures um, to show my immediate neighbors um, and how this would bring it into conformance. Um, and so basically my point, and we can go through them kind of quickly. First one you have is 378 Gorham Road, um, which they have a shed slash garage right at the end of their driveway. Um, the next one is 386, which is one of my uh, abutters to, to my west. And the picture that you're looking at, uh, the large white barn with the car in front, is actually their second structure. So their actual house is over to the right. Um, and this two-story uh, large barn and garage, um, again, at the end of their driveway. And then we have the next one, 383 Gorham Road, is directly across the street um, from my house, across the street from Gorham Road. So a much smaller house, but a similar situation with the shed slash garage at the end of the driveway. Number 380 is um, my neighbor just across the street um, that has the other corner lot for Sweetbriar and Gorham Road. Um, and again, only the only part visible from from the road is their drive or is their garage at the end of the street. Uh, 374, another example. Um, and then we have 387, another one. So they come in all different shapes and sizes, but it appears to be the norm to have them all uh, located uh, as such. The last one you have, um, I am not very computer savvy, but this is what I drew in for myself. So the width is exactly right of my, my little pictured uh, carriage house. Um, I used it in this picture originally. Um, I could see the stakes where I've staked it out. Um, so granted, it's not a very high-tech picture, but this is what I'm aiming to do. It was a pretty good job. Thank you. Uh, the granting of the variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. The granting of the variance will have no impact on the natural environment. Placing the dwelling in the proposed location in the clearing where the previous second dwelling was located will preserve the natural environment. My property provides about 500 feet of untouched forest with trails for everyone to enjoy down Sweetbriar Lane. I have no intentions of cutting and clearing beautiful trees that have been there for hundreds of years. The natural woods are the reason I bought and loved my property, and by placing the dwelling in my proposed location, the natural woodlands would not be disturbed. And then on the following page, and I again apologize, I was fighting with the website to get a nice color picture. Um, I've circled a highlighted area. Um, it is difficult to see um, from the from the highlighted area back, the lot is fully wooded. Um, in that one little spot is where the original accessory dwelling was and where there are no large trees that would need to be cut. Okay. And you're not in a flood zone, so you're okay with that. Right. And you own the property? Yes, sir. Okay. And so these are just the accessory documents that were required um, with the application. You did a very nice job on your packaging, by the way. Thank you. Okay, uh, why don't I open the public hearing and see if there's anybody who'd like to speak on this issue. Public hearing is open, if anybody would like to speak. You have one letter, is that correct? And any phone calls? No. Letter is from uh, Michael and Ann Bell. Five. I had a call from Michael Bell as well, so he's is it, Okay. Interact. Thank you. So this is a follow-up from your phone call. Uh, five, uh, Sweetbriar Lane. Uh, dear Zoning Board members, we are the property owners of five, Sweetbriar Lane, which is located behind Ms. Davis's property. Upon receipt of the appre uh, appeal notice, I looked at the setback area from the side of Sweetbriar Lane. Although the 15-foot variance is a minor distance, in a, our opinion, the building will change the scenery as you enter Sweetbriar Lane. Sweetbriar is much wooded street at its entrance. 
In the recent past, trees were removed from Ms. Davis's property along Sweetbriar side, creating a clearing. With plans now to construct a building within, without the 50-foot set-off, the building will be uh, very noticeable. I would like to recommend that the board look and requiring the replanting of hardwood and evergreens within the open space on Sweetbriar. I believe this would be a fair compromise to allow the variance to move forward. We would even uh, be okay with the replacing of saplings in the height range of six to eight feet, allowing them to mature in place. And thank you for your consideration. <coughs> Were you aware of them having any concerns? Or um, no, I was not. Um, because of the layout of our neighborhood, um, we don't have a lot of contact with, with each other. The one neighbor that I do see often, um, I spoke to them twice, <coughs> and they had no um, reservations about it. Um, if it would be okay, could I address some of the points in this letter? Sure, if you'd like to give me a copy of it. Um, I got one just uh, prior to now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, just, just a couple of notes here. Uh, they mentioned in the recent past, trees were removed from my property. Um, so I have owned the property since 2007. Uh, and have never removed any trees. The only trees that have been removed have been ones that are fallen, um, a couple across my yard. Um, what they could be referring to in the clearing, um, lots of wild raspberries and weeds, basically, that I cleared out to be a garden spot um, previous uh, to my plan to, to build the accessory dwelling unit there. Um, so I have not actually removed, I guess it depends on what you call the recent past, but since I've owned it, I haven't removed any trees. Um, and again, that's, that's the reason why I bought the lot was for the trees. Um, as far as the landscaping goes, um, good part is, uh, as I said, I'm trying to build this uh, for my parents. My mother is a uh, <coughs> certified landscaper and horticulturist. That's what her degree is in. So there will be landscaping involved. No, I haven't gotten to the specifics of if they're evergreens, hardwoods, um, et cetera. Um, I guess I would, would also like to point out, as I mentioned, that the entrance to Sweetbriar is very wooded. Um, and a big reason for that is my property. So the 500 feet that go down, most of the lots there are not wooded. Um, mine is um, the most visible because it is long and skinny. There are two right across the street that are wooded. Uh, but beyond that, everyone's house on Sweetbriar is clearly visible from the road. Um, so in my opinion, the reason why it's wooded kind of in the in the first place is because of, of all the, the trees that are on my property to begin with. Do you have any concerns if the board were to approve this with putting some saplings up along that road? Or, uh... I don't. Um, I, have, I have some pictures that would show you guys the clearing, so I don't know that it would be necessary, but I will say if this is a, a make or break issue in your opinion, I would be willing uh, to plant the trees. What might come up, and I'll just throw it out to you while we're at this point, is that the board may come back saying we'll approve it subject to um, Mr. Longstaff's approval of whatever is there right. and allow you to work that out. I would typically think that we're not, our job is not to go count trees. Right. Uh, he loves counting trees, mm -hmm. but that may come back, and so that is that something that would be reasonable? In yes, I'm process? open to discussion. If, if after all the information I present in the pictures, if there's still a worry, I, I would be and willing to do that. And it may not. It may, right. The board may feel it's not an issue, but I just wanted to bring that while sure. it was at time. Okay. That's the only letter and phone call. I'm going to close the public hearing point of this meeting. And what I'll do is bring it back to the board for questions. And uh, feel free. I do have some <coughs> some questions about the vegetation that you were talking about. You said you cleared some brush or right. could you show me where that would be Absolutely. and roughly the area, the size of the area? Sure, and I have um, actual oh. pictures. You look at oh, right on the screen right here. Right there. Um, okay. Yeah, so I'll show you where it is on here. Thank you. Yep. Um, I'll try to speak loudly enough so everyone can hear it. If you want to just grab the microphone again, that'd okay. be a classic. That's why we got that there. But you might need to turn it on. These will on, on the button. bottom. On the bottom. Hear me? We could hear you without it, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have been accused of having a loud voice. No, it's not that. It's, it's for the. For You've the got it now. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> so currently, um, my lot is wooded. This is Sweetbriar again. This is Gorham Road. Uh, the lot is wooded from here to here. Um, the original accessory dwelling unit was right here on the property line. So there's the natural clearing. 
and then immediately from here all the way back is fully wooded. So where I see the break in the photo, that's where the that is exactly perpendicular. Unit was. Right, this is standing across okay. Sweetbriar Lane right here um, to show the, the maximum clearing. And I do have it from other angles, um, which I guess is another point I think they had mentioned about being able to see the house. Um, as it is right now, you can see my house through that clearing. Um, so I, just, I don't know that there would be a lot of difference between the view they're getting now and not. And is that because you have trees that have dropped their leaves and now you can see through? Well, or that happens every year. Yeah. Right. I, I'm not sure uh, what they were referring to would be cutting the trees. However, this clearing has been here um, since I bought the property. Maybe they determined that clearing of the brush that could be. was trees and... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, raspberries gone wild. Thank you. A question. Sure, um, will the proposed carriage house, will that be tied into the existing septic system? Yes. Okay. And is the septic system sized to handle that capacity? Yes. Okay. It, uh, the, that septic system was originally designed for those two properties. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's okay. You can shut that one off and you can go back to the other one. <laughs> there you go. I think that was a little feedback. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. <coughs> Um, so yes, this was designed, uh, the septic system, for two dwellings. Um, I've had a, a separate evaluation done um, that has confirmed that it's functioning and can accommodate both dwellings. Great. And Ms. Longstaff, do you concur with the uh, septic system standards and it will be easy to connect up to? Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions from the board? Could you uh, point out to us on that on your draw sketch up there uh, exactly where the septic system is? Yes. Okay, so I do have uh, all the supporting documents. You did. Now it is. I do have some supporting documents that show, show a sketch of the septic design. Um, but basically, what happens is perpendicular to my house, the pipes come out as so. And then they angle over. The septic tank is here. There's a pump station here, and then the leach field is here, uh, which I did have to go ahead um, and get sort of a, a backup approval if something were to happen to the septic uh, system and the leach field where they would replace it, and it would be in exactly the same location. So uh, you're you're saying there where the line goes across, there's it it, it precludes you from moving the building back. Exactly. So. Um, I guess the, the whole point of this is to show um, one is trying to keep it in line with the driveway uh, to conform to the neighborhood as well. I, I didn't include it in this because quite frankly we don't have the funds to do it now, but at some point I would like to add a garage um, that would look exactly like uh, the house plans that have a carriage house. It would just be a, a, an actual carriage house I guess at that point. Um, so one is to keep it in line with the driveway. The biggest problem um, is, however, on this side are all the septic pumps and stations, and the lines that go to that um, come across diagonally and go back. Um, so I, I hear that moving it over anymore might damage, as I talked about, the heavy equipment to repair or to be able to get around between the two buildings, um, particularly if there is a garage at some point. Um, but yes, the, the thing that precludes me from putting it sort of in the middle of the left are all the septic so from the back corner of the of the proposed house to your current house, um, on that on your current house end, how far back is is it that that line goes over? So how how much further from that from the proposed house? How how much further over is it to to, to where the line goes across the septic? Okay, I'm not sure. I understand the question. From that back corner, that it, the corner that's closest to your current house. Yes, back corner. Correct. How much further back is it that that, how, where exactly, the how line? much further, where, the, where does the line come, mm, come that, across? That is a good question, and that's, a, that's an answer that I don't know, which is also part of the reason why I'm nervous to drive anything over there. Um, we've had it repaired twice, and as I said, I've got an illustration in here that shows the basics. Um, it's not to scale, uh, but that's one thing that I did not foresee is marking the exit line. I've had them work on once, so I know the general layout, but I don't know exactly how many so it is possible that you may be able to move that back without an issue. Um, if, if I were to dig up the septic line, move the septic tank, and put 
No, I meant without without moving them. I just you don't know where the line's going across there. I know generally, but I can't tell you the number of feet. Oh, I missed that skin. Exactly. Okay, I saw the other one. Okay, okay. I see. Okay. Under tab four. Yeah, yeah, last down. page. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the questions from the board. Let's go through the uh, the requirements. This is an RF zone. And the RF zone does allow for uh, the accessory units, so it does meet that requirement. And why don't we go through the performance standards of the uh, the accessory unit, okay? Uh, okay. I'm yeah. not sure that I'm prepared for that, but I did bring my application, so we'll do that. We don't have to. Um, we don't? No. Actually, uh, I've been just told uh, that we don't have to review that's that. That's not part of the. That, that's a permit that's issued. That's a permit that's issued by the code office. What building? she's asking for is the variance to locate the building. Awesome. So that's, that's what you guys are reviewing. The accessory unit is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Stop <laughs> horning in on my territory. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a matter of, of where I can put it. I'm not going to need a job. Okay, so um, that's fine. We're not going to worry about it for our boss. Okay. Um, <laughs> stick, so stick to your Mark. knitting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Sure. Mm -hmm. Actually, because it, I would know these walk equipment malfunction. Hmm. Yes. Coming through. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Okay. So close some more. Okay. So, any other questions yes. from the board? Okay. Let's I, go I, through the. I'm oh, sorry. I'm still a little bit confused on this because the, the sketch that you've got here shows that from the back of your house that the septic line goes towards the shed, not towards the proposed house. Okay, which, uh, are you looking at the old septic design? Uh, which like tab that, are you under, please? This one right here. Okay, yes. So that is a very rudimentary um, drawing that I had when I uh, had a problem with the grade of my line going from my house to the septic tank. Okay. And so, uh, just to explain to me where everything was, that's how he drew it. He fit it to the paper, uh, once again, so it's not to scale. Um, and and I think it's hard to... So you're saying that, that this actually comes this direction, this direction, and then back, and not, not going that direction. Because this is where you're, you're saying that the proposed new house is going to be. Right. What I'm saying is that it comes out perpendicular to my house. So on, on that picture... Um, it looks like it's going straight out, but that's because it's going straight out from the back of my house, which if I could step over here one more time. Okay, I'll just hold it like this. Um, so my house is not square to the property. Right. It's angled. So when you look at that picture that you have with the line going directly out from the house, it goes oh, yeah. at this angle. Does that make sense? Well, kind of, but I was just kind of basing it on where they're showing the shed. They're, show, they're showing that it goes right by the shed, which is at the other side of your property. Right. The, the shed is here. Once again, he compressed it. Um, yeah. like it's it's that's, not that's a scale drawing. That's as well okay. as I can answer, okay. I think, the question. All right. Yeah. It would be a little difficult to tell. Good question, though. Good, it is good eye. Okay, let's go through the requirements uh, again. What I'd like to do is start down uh, with Mr. Richard. We'll go all the way down to the finding of fact. Uh, we'll consider the finding of fact as we go through, unless there's something unique, also a conclusion of law as we discuss it. Okay? Uh, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Mr. Richard, would you like to state how you feel about that and your thoughts? On yeah, I think she's... I think she's Proven her point that her, her the situation is her lot. She's got a very narrow building envelope and an existing se septic system that would that forces the accessory dwelling into the setback area. Yeah, so I think that is due to the unique circumstances of the property. I I would have to agree. I guess the the size of her lot certainly is a substantial size compared to a lot of lots in Scarborough, and uh, it looks like the the buildable area where she's where she's trying to put it is maybe the only place that she can put it. Yeah, I would agree with the other two board members' comments. I don't have anything more to add to that. Okay. I agree as well, Mr. Chair. 
Yeah, I agree with nothing to add. Just a question regarding the road being put in. Did the road create the hardship? The road, by virtue of the road being put in when the subdivision was approved, it did change your setback. It changed, you know, from a regular side property, side yard setback, which would be 15 feet. It changed it to a front setback. So now she has two front setbacks. Okay. Um, both mm -hmm. in the RF being 50 feet, so it's substantial. It's a substantial setback. I mean, that's part of the conclusions of law. I mean, I, I find I would think that's a legitimate reason to to look at that as part of why I would support item number one. It, I'm not stating that it's a hardship, but that's the, the but fact. It, was but it did create it created yeah. a larger setback. Okay, I mean, and I agree with the other board members yeah. with the other questions. But I just thought. Uh, it, and it looks to me as property six shares that same issue. They just it doesn't hasn't hit them yet. The one across the street from you. Right, and it. and property six for some reason. Um, uh, I checked uh, at the town hall here to try to get their frontage, um, and for some reason it's not listed on the map on the website nor on the physical map. I did use the tool that's on your website to try to measure, um, and their frontage is two hundred. You um, figured out how to use the tool. What's, what's that? <laughs> you figured out how to use it. I tool? figured out how to use it. Couldn't figure out how to save it, print it, or export it in any fashion. <laughs> but <laughs> but I did use it, yep. Okay. The uh, number two is the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or the fair market value of abutting property. I think that's pretty straightforward. I, I, even though she was unable to export it, I think she did a good job illustrating what the the accessory drilling will look like, and I think it fits in fine with the other photos in the neighborhood. Absolutely. Yeah, I would. I would have to agree that based on the photos that uh, that were provided, it it looks like it's pretty going to be very similar to what everything else in the neighborhood. I would agree, and the applicant's already stated to us as well that she's willing to work with the one. I don't know if you can call it complaining, but the one issue issue that came up with the tree. So, I mean, there's a willingness to make sure that that's creating a character. I don't even know if she really needs to do that, but I mean, it's good that she's willing to. I agree. Uh, with the previous comments, I have nothing to add. I think if she had the ability to move the um, structure within the building envelope, which she doesn't because of the septic system, it would have been closer to, to what the character should be, but in this case, it's the best choice for her, and I think in this situation, the best choice altogether. I struggled at first with this item for the reason of um, uh, character of the neighborhood and uh, reasonableness. I actually think the drawing and the, uh, the taking of the photographs was really pretty smart and uh, I love the design that you did you. with uh, making it look like a carriage house and so I'm, I'm comfortable with that also. Uh, next one. The practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. I think self-explanatory again, no. I think it's a, it's a, it's a condition of a lot, uh, the width of it in an existing septic system in place. You know that. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but also I think uh, when the prior owner had the house, uh, that, that, that secondary unit there, uh, that was prior to the road being put in, and that road changed everything. So. Uh, her, her wanting to put another one there, that's really the only place that she can put it. And so I'm good with that. Yeah, I would agree with the chair's original comment about the road. Bringing that up was a good. I agree that uh, with the current condition of the lot and the existing condition of the septic system, that um, they're doing the best they can in this scenario. I agree, nothing else to add. And I would say that the road, um, as you pointed out, I, I, and I just think that ties a lot to the issue of uh, is not a result of anything that you've certainly done. Uh, next one is <coughs> is uh, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Yeah, I mean, I would. I guess we're going on her word and Brian's that she couldn't like. Mr. Stock said she can't push the building back due to the septic being in the way and with the with the requirements of the accessory drawing being in a hundred foot radius and she's really left with with no other choices as 
you know, the, is the way I look at it. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I I think uh, if the septic system were in a, in a position uh, that would allow it, I would insist on it that being moved back uh, to be within the envelope. But uh, because of the septic, I think I, I'm, I'm good with This is always the toughest one for us to get by. Um, I don't know if there's, the long staff, if there's any way that we can determine <laughs> if the septic system is where it's kind of showing to be or if there is availability of movement of that she provided to the design yeah that are there that's the best information we have without actually excavating right yeah. so the only way to do it would be to excavate I mean j just for the record and to be clear um, I didn't say that it, the septic system that the building couldn't be pushed back but you understand that the requirement for the accessory unit says it has to be within a hundred feet of the house so if it was just the simple matter of putting another building on the lot and it wasn't an accessory unit and she was asking for the setback, then it could go sure. anywhere on the lot and even behind the septic system. An accessory unit in order to meet the standards has to be within 100 feet if okay. it's detached. Um, that's your job to determine whether or not she's meeting the, you know, no feasible alternative and, and, and again, go to the definition of feasible alternative that's in the in the uh, in the ordinance um, and I think it talks about um, uh, cost and something else I can't remember it escapes me at the moment but you pull it up real quick um, and why don't we uh, go ahead uh, similar to my previous comment I mean, is the current condition of the lot and the existing condition of the septic system and also um, excavating the current septic system just to gain another 5 to 10, 12, 15 feet would not be a feasible option for them, I don't believe. It would not be a feasible alternative. I agree, and, add, and to add to that, um, there, it's going in the existing location or the location where the previous structure was, so it's having the least destructive effect on the property. It's going in that same spot. She doesn't have to take trees down, and um, if this were a tidal lot where properties were closer together and the lots weren't quite as big, I think it would make a bigger difference. But in this case, with the size of these lots, minimal minimal impact. So I think it's the best feasible alter alternative at this point. And uh, per Ms. Monkstaff's point, uh, practical difficulty, I'll just read it in. A case where strict application of dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant significant economic injury to the applicant. So the question I think at hand as I see it is if and I can just uh, mm -hmm. one more time thank you. Uh, if I'm gonna translate this the way I would interpret this uh, <laughs> um, the 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 use is allowed. So we know the use is allowed in the zone. The reason for the 100 foot setback is actually, since I wrote that ordinance, I can tell you what it was. We don't want <coughs> to be in a situation where we're subdividing properties that shouldn't be subdivided after the fact. So the intent is to make it part of the primary residence, make it feel like it's part of the primary residence, and, and, uh, but still allow for options. One of the questions that I had, and I'd like to have you clarify if you wouldn't mind, is why you're not connecting it to the property. And uh, I'll get to that and ask you to answer it in a second. But that, that is part of that issue. It also ties into the, again, it's allowed. Uh, and the economic injury, I think, will be addressed by what the applicant's going to say regarding connecting it. The little easier said than done sometimes. Um, but the most important part is if we're not exactly sure that septic system is, it can cause havoc. It doesn't, in my opinion, need to be there, given the fact that we're allowed the ordinance the way it's written. Uh, the other um, item uh, that ties to that is it needs to be, even though I'm not supposed to look at this rule, uh, it's only going to have one electrical panel, a low on circuit, it's going to be on one uh, circuit, and it'll be tied to the septic. So it's, it's in essence, one whole property, and that's the intent of, 
the reasons for that ordinance when a, when an accessory unit is disconnected so that we don't come back 20 years from now and somebody says, oh, wait a minute, I meet the rule for the, the uh, soccer river corridor rule. And, and that's really what that was designed to stop. Okay, so that's, uh, if you would like to help me out with explaining why you couldn't do something connected to the property or uh, closer to the property, that would be helpful. Uh, sure, I, I think uh, you did kind of answer the question yourself, it's cost. So I've talked to my uh, contractor about several different options, uh, some of which are additions to my home. Um, my home was built, I believe, in 1936. Um, once again, it had some damage done to it. It was taken down to the foundation and rebuilt. Um, and for some reason, when they rebuilt it, um, they did not square up the foundation. So my house is neither square to itself or the earth. Um, <laughs> yes, and so it drives my contractor quite crazy. Um, so between that and just the additional cost for the estimate of um, the addition, it was cost prohibitive. Um, as well as um, I would say that I think it's important for my parents um, to have a little bit of privacy as well as myself. Um, you know, they are at the age where they might need some immediate help where I would be just a few feet away from them. Um, but I do think that it would uh, be more practical for them to have their own space as, as well as myself. Um, but the real reason is the cost. That's it. Could you ex explain um, the cost difference between the two designs? Yes. So uh, what my contractor said is that when you're doing uh, an addition, it's always more expensive uh, than doing a separate um, location. Uh, this one will be on a slab. Um, we'll have a frost wall, but um, only a slab. Um, as opposed to where mine has a crawl space under it. So connecting the two would be an additional cost, as well as trying to match up something that is not square to um, hopefully new square. Uh, as well, it's not the same contractor as no, before. No, it is not. <laughs> no. Okay, good. I, I feel comfortable with that answer, and I feel comfortable with the information provided. So I would, again, support that, and I'd also put that in the uh, conclusions of law to tie that together. In, a, in addition to connecting them, you're also getting into an issue with the septic system because you have to have that redone if you're connecting it off to the back of the house, correct? Um, well, we, we are going to have to run a new line, um, when uh, a new angled line from the new dwelling to the, to the existing septic. The septic is big enough to accommodate both, but one of those lines was closed off at some point. Um, it will be sharing the same water supply, uh, the same septic system, and the same electricity, um, so, uh, but there, there will have to be a portion of the line obviously reattached from the new house to the existing septic, um, but it would be minimal work. I, I don't know that there would be, a, I haven't looked at the cost difference between an addition, you know, um, for, the, for the septic uh, versus the, the standalone. Next item would be, uh, the granting of the variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. And I'll start again with Mr. Richard. Oh, bless you. Bless you, Mr. Uh, yeah, I think it's kind of self-explanatory. I think um, it definitely will have, doesn't make it have an, yeah, an adverse effect on the natural environment. I mean, it's going to be built in the clearing as it is. And, yeah, it appears to me that most of the most of the properties have a, 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 a detached garage or some type of a building that's detached. That it's going to be uh, the similar type of a property. Maybe it's not going to look exactly the same, but it's going to be pretty close. It's, it's going to fit within the neighborhood. Yeah, and I think the applicant has stated on numerous occasions when she's been going over her application, her desire to keep the vegetation and the trees and, and things like that. So she's not really looking to have an adverse effect on the on the neighborhood. I think she's trying to do everything contrary to that to make sure that she does everything. I just reminded this is mostly on the, uh, the natural environment. Yeah. Which is, yeah, which yeah, which is the neighborhood, the but I just want to make sure we're using the right terms. Yeah. I'll also reiterate my point concerning the septic system and a finding of fact that the septic system is sized for this new assessor unit so there wouldn't be any excavation or tearing up of the backyard or removing of any of the trees nearby to make an addition or upgrade it. So that does not have to be done. I have nothing else to add, I agree. Good. And uh, just to 
confirm, did I hear you say that you've also looked at an alternative plan in the event the subject system failed? Yes, sir. And that's on the, basically on the same site, probably using it the mound system. Mm -hmm. I have an alternate design that's been submitted. Great. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit worried about the raspberries. I, I love raspberries, and I have a little bit of a problem with that. Um, <laughs> there's, there's still plenty. <laughs> uh, oh, they also over. bring poison ivy with them. Yeah. Um, the uh, suggestion I would have in here, and uh, before we make a motion uh, tied to this, to me would be that uh, the reasonable guidance of the Code Enforcement Department uh, regarding any vegetation that they think uh, would apply to... Uh, do you feel comfortable with that flexibility um, if needed? And I, I'll leave it as if needed. If, if needed, I guess. You want to draw the, the parameters of your condition out I, a little bit more specifically. I'm happy to carry them out. I believe that, uh, that your sound judgment, whether there needs to be any or one or 20, is fine by me. I think having a, a, a some, somebody from the town making a call meets the requirement that I would expect and it takes it out of um, the question of the applicant or the owner that uh, brought up the issue. <coughs> I don't see any reason to put arbitrary conditions on there that are um, al almost... Uh, it appears that there's a pretty substantial garden there now too. Um, if, if, for example, just as an example, if we were to um, require um, two saplings evenly spaced along that, that open space to kind of fill in that space. Would you feel that that was adequate? I vegetation? don't personally have a problem with it at all, but I'm trying to give respect to the people that do. Um, so I, I, I'm fine with whatever you would do. I would think that'd be sufficient. I'd Once be more comfortable, uh, Brian, if you, would, if you would personally take a look at it and see, if I, because from what I'm seeing from the aerial view, it appears to me that there's an awful lot of trees on that lot a lot of vegetation out there so it may be that nothing is needed it may be that once you go there you see that you know what it would it would be better if we had a little bit here so I, I'm, I'm with Mr. Chairman Maroon if uh, if you determine that it should have then I'm good with that. <laughs> if you're not comfortable with that, I don't, I, I don't want to belabor the point it's just that there, there's nothing in the ordinance that requires her to plant anything right. there so if you folks on the zoning board want to make that a condition, you certainly can, but you should be specific as to what you are requiring rather than to leave it in my in my sound judgment because there are those that would argue I have no sound judgment. <laughs> I, no, it's just not very specific. And, and so I could arbitrarily go out there and say, you know what, I think you ought to plant 10 trees here. Right. Uh, that, But you haven't really given me a range or anything. So, so what I think... It, and that's okay. Well, it, if if the neighbor, for example, wanted to come back and you know and, and argue the point, you just kind of left yeah. it out there hanging. So it would be better if you just were specific about. What about my, my thought, Mr. Maroon, was just to put a couple of trees in place to break up the line, so that you're not just seeing a building face. Once they grow in, it breaks up the view. How about something like this: two to five trees as or bushes as would be appropriate. How about zero Is it five? possible for me to speak right now? Sure, go ahead. Please. Um, I don't know if you can see it there, but as uh, luck would have it, before uh, this plan came along, I have actually planted eight large high bush blueberries um, right along uh, my line. I don't know if we can zoom in and see them, um, but even without request, I mean, I, I agree that I don't want there to be a clean open view myself it will be landscaped um as i said i'm not sure how but i have planted either eight or nine high bush already. blueberries that, that are growing right there, there right now yes sir that's one of them <laughs> that's, that's mm -hmm. one of the little guys sticking out. Yeah. mr chair i i wouldn't think that there would be any more than two that we should require i, I would agree with uh, fine two deciduous trees i I don't think it needs any more than that to be perfect right yeah. now. It's fine. fine. So I just suggest that. It's not in the motion at this point. It's just right. been discussed. So, uh, and again, I always try to work with the community when we can. And if somebody has a minor issue, uh, to me it doesn't do any damage if it's not going to affect you. But I think the high bush blueberries are a great idea, and I, um, and they do grow high. So uh, the property <laughs> uh, is not located in the whole, you're not in the flood zone, so that's 
is not an issue. So any, uh, let's come back rather quickly to the uh, conclusions of law. Anybody care to add anything other than what they've already put in regarding the conclusions of law? Uh, me being the biggest is that I think this is triggered by the fact that the road was put in, uh, not solely but mostly. It is consistent with our rules uh, regarding allowing an accessory unit. It does meet those requirements. She has the right to have an accessory unit. The design, in my opinion, is consistent with the neighborhood. Actually, I think she did a good job documenting such uh, with showing the other homes. And it's kind of a traditional, that, that neighborhood's kind of a traditional 50s style separated garage neighborhood, which I think is nice to keep that, that format. I like that format. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, uh, I would tie all of those in along with um, meeting, as far as I can see, Again, just a quick run through. Um, it's not due to the unique, it, it, it is due to the unique circumstances of the property, which, in my opinion, is caused by at least by some degree the road. Uh, it won't make a difference in the neighborhood, as discussed, because of the fact that there are similar properties, quite a few, in fact. Uh, and it it almost without it almost looks like it is is missing. Uh, it isn't anything to do with the applicant or prior owner. There was a fire. There used to be two properties buildings there. Uh, there's, uh, there may or may not be other alternatives, but this based on the information we have and based on reasonableness, uh, that the feasibleness, uh, it, it makes sense where it's put and it's within that 100 foot rule and it doesn't violate the septic tank, which uh, a septic system and a far bigger problem would be creating a problem with the septic system in my opinion. I uh, grant the variance is bringing the property into conformity and compliance with surrounding comes back to the same issue of the drawings and the design, which I think is very creative. Um, the natural environment, she's keeping the raspberry bushes, she put some blueberry bushes in, so we just need to know the season. And uh, she's on the zone one. So that to me uh, covers both. Anybody care to add to that? And we would like the applicant to add two trees on that side of the property. Too. So is, is that, yeah, do I have a motion? And in a, if they want to add that to the formal motion, that would be I great. So I'll great. make a motion to add two trees to that side of the property to create a visual break to the structure. Deciduous or evergreen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you talked about deciduous. I'm fine with that. Sure. Okay, uh, any other, uh, okay, set the motion. Do I have a second on the motion? Okay. All right, so the motion is to uh, approve as requested with two deciduous trees um, planted uh, equidistance per the, the capable hands and eye of the uh, code enforcement officer, <laughs> uh, which could be scary. Uh, any comment on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Best of luck. Mm -hmm. What do you? Uh, I have to ask just a question. You're sure. so thorough. Sure. What, what do you do for a career? You're pretty thorough. Oh, thank you. I, I think it was just because it was so important to me, and I get quite nervous speaking in public, so I, I wanted uh, all my information in here. So if I choked, I could just read it. Um, <laughs> but I am a veterinarian. Well, I trust my dog to you. Um, the thoroughness makes a difference for us. It allows us a lot yeah. more flexibility in how we look at things. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> About and we'll reuse this. We'll be able to drop your taxes because we can reuse those envelopes folders. Okay, the next approval is a 2564. It's a practical difficulty variance request by Kevin Coyne, 60 Ocean Avenue, Assistance Map U2, parcel 181. And we have representatives. Uh, Ms. Davis, do you want the, your drawings back? Do you want your drawings back? Okay. Is it a cord for the computer plug-in? Um, Can I present? Good question. Uh, from the uh, back, do we have the ability to have a cord for a plug-in for a yeah, computer? Yeah, I have to unhook this one. Yes, chair. Thank you.
you want the uh, you want the pointer too? Can take off. Oh, I don't think I away from it. Oh, good luck. State your name and address. We'll go from there. Kevin Coyne, 60 Ocean Avenue. Yeah, Mr. Coyne, thank you. You're doing a practical difficulty variance uh, for uh, what would you like to accomplish? I have a um, house at 60 Ocean Avenue that I'd like to tear down and replace with a two and a half story structure. And I've been through this process before, where um, I have the approval. I had the approval, and um, my drawings changed slightly, and my circumstances changed slightly. So. Um, when I met with Brian, he thought it'd be a good idea to uh, reapply and have the approval from the board on the new drawings. And uh, before we continue, uh, Ms. Longstaff, could you explain to us what uh, what happened? And I know this is kind of an odd circumstance, so if you could walk us through that would be great. Sure. Um, as Mr. Coyne pointed out in April of this year, um, he did receive approval for a practical difficulty variance from the board. Uh, for uh, uh, the project which included the raising of the existing one-story structure and then to build a replacement dwelling uh, with an additional story and a full basement. Um, that was the plan that was presented to the board. Um, since then, uh, Mr. Coyne came in with his building uh, permit application and drawings um, and I noticed that the full basement was gone and he had added an additional half story uh, on to um, the original story, so so now it's a re rel it's a two and a half story with no basement. Um, the differential, because of the way the original design was done, it actually only resulted in about a four foot differential in height. But it, yet it was not what the board approved. It was not the, the set of plans that the board saw when they made the approval. Um, he still is under the 35 height, uh, foot <coughs> height limit, um, but I felt like it needed to come back to the board because um, for a couple of reasons, the neighbors uh, should have a right to, to see this new design and perhaps they would have some comments on a four foot height differential, perhaps not, uh, but at least to give them the opportunity to and also to give the board an opportunity to look at this um, if, if there was anything about that, that that they wanted to question, they should have the opportunity to do that. So I recommended that Mr. Coyne reapply for a new variance um, appeal with this new design <coughs> and and trust that hopefully that will be the, the final design. I don't think he, he's going to change it again. But <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> Just a, a clarification for me. I'm looking, do I have those plans? I have Here. Uh, and further, just to finish up, um, Mr. Coyne is not proposing any changes to the setback variances that you granted, that the board granted. So the setbacks aren't changing, it's just right. going up. That is correct, going up. 
I compared the two site plans and there's no difference. There's no dimension difference in the setbacks. So basically the only difference is, is that you approved the one and a half story house and now it's, or a, a two story house and now it's a uh, two and a half story house with no basement. The, and the reason, and I'm sure Mr. Coyne will explain the reasons why he changed the design. Now, is the design, exterior design, the same as before, only just raised, or has it been changed also? The exterior design, I think, changed slightly. And I, think uh, the, I reversed the garage. <coughs> the garage was on the, um, the left, and I moved it to the right, um, mainly for uh, sunlight. The sun rises to the left on, on where the lot's situated. So. And... Um, Okay, uh, why don't we go right through the criteria. This property is located at 60 Ocean. There's a little way to pull up. You don't have access yeah. to the house now, right? Uh, yeah, uh, to the plans? Right, uh, just you know, the, 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 uh, the, yeah. the, the neighborhood. Yeah, the GIS. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can do that. Thank you. So uh, if you'd like, Mr. Coyne, why don't we go through... Oh, we I can't pull it up because he's got the... Uh, okay, we'll, oh. we'll come back. We'll, we'll come back to it. That's okay. You want me, we, I can pull off there if you want. No, right. The second, I just yeah. want to know I have the option. That would be great. So so um, before we continue, why don't I ask if the board has any questions? Sorry, I do. Yes, go ahead, sir. Um, my, my question is, and I don't know, maybe I'm just missing this. Does this... Uh, I'm concerned with so many changes. Does that void the prior approval that we did completely? Yes. Okay. This is a new approval. This is a new approval. The old approval is is not applicable. So, uh, because we're saying this is a new design. If you approve it. If we approve it. Th thank if you. If you don't approve it, the old the old it will still be stands. in place. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's a good way of putting it. Thank you. All right. So so this doesn't negate him being able to do what we had previously proposed, or he had previously proposed. It may not be able to be done, and I think that's up to Mr. Coyne to point that out. Um, but as far as this is concerned, if this is approved, it will replace the previous. That's how you understand it. Is that correct, Mr. Klein? Yes. Okay. And if not, it will revert back to the other one. He's, yeah, it's not a double jeopardy situation. You'll have to basically... I would need an extension. That's okay. Um, That's okay. We can deal with that, okay. too. All right. All right. Mr. Klein, if you'd like to start. Um, anybody else any questions before we continue? Why don't we go right through the requirements of the... Uh, the practical difficulty variance. So the first is the need of the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Would you like to answer that? That would be great. Yes, the, the variance is needed because the existing structure was built before current zoning <coughs> required setbacks and property lines. Uh, the lot is pie shaped with one side only being 30 feet deep. And the grading of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or the fair market value of abutting properties. Um, this house will definitely improve the neighborhood. Um, currently, I call my house the, the shack among houses. It's one of the few shacks at Higgins Beach that hasn't been rebuilt, um, probably since uh, the 1950s or so. So uh, I think it will be a definite improvement to the neighborhood. And also, um, some of my neighbors replied via email, and I forwarded them to Brian. We have those. Okay. So, uh, uh, my neighbors are very excited about me replacing my house. <laughs> they ask me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Uh, I've owned the property for 22 years, and the prior owner, owner had it for 50 years, and they did not create, or nor did I create this problem. And could you elaborate on what the problem is specifically? Well, uh, the structure was built on the ground, and uh, it has a rotting problem. Most places at Higgins Beach were built on cedar stilts years back, so this was built on the ground. So I um, have to replace floors occasionally due to the rot and moisture. The heaves, because the ground heaves, um, it's a you know, substandard structure. So. And compared to my neighbors, there are most of the houses around me are much more modern. Two of them are from the 90s. Okay. So I'm more concerned about your specific property and what the, what the challenges are with that property. You say that it, it moves. It's, a, it's not on 
It's just sitting on the ground. Is it on pads or anything? No. It's not even on pads? No. Nothing? No. Not cinder blocks, anything. That's a first. Uh, That's pretty bad. <laughs> and what have you had to replace? Um, floors through the years. You know, joists, floor joists. Floor joists. Um, yeah. Do so you have to go down through the top? Yeah. They're right. And if I have any plumbing issues, the pipe's on the ground but between the um, the cottage and the ground. So, yeah. You have to pull up floors to get to it. Okay. Um, it's a great surf shack, but that's it. <laughs> uh, the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant program. We said no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. Yeah, so um, we've looked at uh, raising the structure back in the 90s, and at the time it was, you know, $7,000. The town appraises the house, the structure itself, at $19,000. To do any, you know, structural work or lift it up or do anything uh, would not be economical. So it would be a good return on investment. Yeah, on the, on the, I'll come back to that after. I'm sorry. It, you know, uh, you know, excuse me. Again, um, it also has two by four construction, which isn't good for the main winters, and flat roofs, very low ceilings inside. So it's. Okay. And no other feasible alternatives available to the applicant except a variance. And if you just want to read that right into the record, you're fine. Okay. No other feasible alternative is available to the applicant. The current structure rests on the ground, meaning it will is very weak structurally due to moisture rot. This prohibits lifting the structure, as been done by many other Higgins Beach cottages. The sewer line rests on the ground, accessibility only through the floor is removed. In addition, the structure is substandard in modern terms, low ceilings, two by four exterior wall construction, limited insulation with a very low pitched roof. The town assessed the structure $19,000, which would be close to the value of lifting the property to perform the scope of work. It's currently appraised at 19000 Please so. Okay. <laughs> the land's not. <laughs> no, but that's what it gets. <laughs> <laughs> um, the granting of the variance will not, uh, I'm sorry, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. And if you just want to read that in your yes. point. By granting a variance, the property will be but into line with the surrounding properties. The two properties to the immediate to the west and one to the east are new construction built in the 1990s. The house directly across the street is owned by Fred Poor, who is an architect and is of postco postcard quality. So, And the reason why we ask you to read this in is because the record is not the paper. The record is the verbal oh. conversation. So, so that's why it's so important. The record includes the paperwork, yep. but it's not exclusive to, and the minutes sometimes don't reflect everything, so that's why we, we do that. Um, the, uh, let's see where they go. The granting of the variance will not uh, have an unreasonably effect on the natural environment. Uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, post powder, powder, powder post beetles that will be disappointed. But. And again, if you want to read that right in, go ahead. The variance is suitable to the current environment. The footprint of the parcel will not change, nor will the load on the subject will be, which has been in place for the life of the property. In addition, the structural infrastructure has remained on the property for decades. For example, there's already an installed septic system. And uh, when you say that the load on the septic system will change, same number of bedrooms or different number of bedrooms? It's a two-bedroom structure. And it's currently a two-bedroom? Yes. And the new version will be? Yes. A two-version? Yes, a two-bedroom. Okay. Uh, you're not in a shoreland zone, so you're eligible for this? Variance. Okay. And why don't I open the public hearing? Would anybody like to speak on this issue? Question. Oh, sorry. That's okay. No problem. You can speak later, though. Yeah. Uh, nobody wish to speak on this issue. I've got a couple of letters. I'll read those in. A couple of emails sent. Any phone calls on top of that, or just the email? One is from Ivor Carlson at 64 Ocean Avenue. It looks like a great house, Kevin. Should fit in well with the other homes on Ocean Avenue. Can't wait to see it go up. I'm assuming you took the plans over to these people. Yes. Uh, the next one is from uh, Rick and Deborah Doherty. Uh, congratulations on your plans for your new house. It is a classic beauty. Um, this is Higgins Beach? Yes. Uh, <laughs> we usually don't get compliments. Uh, as, our, as your neighbor, newest neighbors on 61 Ocean Avenue, Deborah and I thank you for your construction, uh, consideration and opportunity to review the subject. Uh, architectural drawings. We believe that your project, when complete, will be an outstanding asset to our neighborhood. We take no exceptions to these plans in any way. 
thanks again for consideration for enhancing the unique and special character of the Higgins Beach community. We hope and trust that you will be fully successful in your efforts. Uh, you are sincerely Rick and Deborah Doherty, 61 Ocean Avenue, Scarborough Lane. And those are the only two. Uh, last chance on public hearing. Close the public hearing part and uh, come back to the board with discussions on uh, the new proposal, or for that matter, if you have questions regarding why the change, I think that's fair game too. And when we start down here, Mr. Lizell. Uh Start with item one, you mean? Sure. Yeah, item one, uh, to me it's... Or anything, Mr. Lizell. I'm sorry, not on the criteria, just open okay. form. No, I think this is pretty straightforward. I remember the uh, case that we had earlier, and this is very similar. Uh, not a lot of change, they just moved the structure up. Um, he's still within the guidelines. Um, the structure fits on the property pretty well. The issue was around the shape of the lot, which is question one. It's triangular shaped lot, makes it extremely difficult to build within the envelope. That's what it comes down to. So um, he didn't change anything else besides going up. To me, it's very straightforward. Mr. Quinn, could you show us the picture of the overview of the, of the, I think you've got a picture on your screen or the ability on your screen to show sort of the overview of your home compared to the neighbors, is that right? Yeah. Is there a way to enlarge that at all? Magnifying glass, man. I'll take a minute. <laughs> Working the magic. Suppose he wants my mouse, too. There, yeah. Try the magnifying glass piece. See where it's uh, down in the bottom underneath the picture. A little bit further right there. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely nothing. Like what about there you, oh, there you go? Uh, how do we get rid of everything else? Is anyone tech you, savvy? You should just be able to scroll along that and move. Okay. It should move. Like what, if you take your mouse or whatever and move, you can. What I'm trying to do is get a visual impact of there you go. two and a half story structure relative to the closeness of the neighbors, the other buildings. Where's your structure in this? Okay, this is my structure here. Are you removing any of those trees? There. And so um, there's a a building right here that's in construction. I'd say it's uh, well, the, the distance from my property, uh, the house structure, to the property line is more than 20 feet, as you can see from the, the drawing. And to this structure, it's probably 70 feet. Are you saying that the property at the bottom corner there is that the new construction, or is there something in between there? Yeah. I could point it out, but yeah, this right here, this house, that right there. This used to be the uh, the building at the parking lot. My neighbor moved down the street. Oh, okay. So you know, and he, he has a deeper lot, so he was set back further from the road. But, you know, it's a really fair distance from... You said roughly 70 feet? 70, yeah. yeah. Give or take. How many feet? 70. 70. Zero. Zero. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then mm -hmm. if you go um, up the street, uh, the lot right here is Piper Shores, so it's an empty building lot. I don't know if it's a paper street or I'm not sure of the property. I think it's part of their conservation. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then, then there is a, a house out of this picture, but it's probably 100 feet away from my property or okay. more than 100 feet away from my structure for sure. All right, thank you. And then, you know, I just wanted to point out, you know, if you compare it to, you know, most of Higgins Beach is like this, you know, very close. It's I'm on the entrance difference. road, so it's not as densely populated. Okay. So you're up near, are you before the restaurant or after the restaurant? Before. Or? I'm the fourth house on the right. You're the fourth house on the right. Okay, it's right after the condos? Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, other questions from the board? Well, I, I just have some questions. I mean, I guess I'm a little bit taken back with coming into the town and with a totally different set of plans. I'm just not, if you could explain why oh. without any, like, sure. Conference um, with Mr. Longstaff or anything. I think you said you had moved the garage too or something like that. Did you not? Yes. Um, I did a mirror image um, with the garage, so that was a first change. Uh, when we started designing it, I realized I wouldn't have any morning sunlight or sunlight most of the day because of the location of the garage. 
So I sent a, a photo or an image to Mr. Longstaff. He didn't think it was an issue to, to reverse that within the same envelope. And then I started looking at the, the construction on the property. There's ledge showing on, on right in my backyard. It's coming right up to the ground. So if I looked at blasting, it would be very expensive and could damage my neighbor's windows or structure. So I started looking at um, just building on, on grade, slab on grade. Uh, it's more economical. And then with losing the basement, my intention, I wanted to keep some more space. So I keep that equal, equal space. So I figured I'd go up and put the second, you know, the third story on of the, the access to the attic. The half story. The half story, yeah. So you would say that the, the primary reason for the design change would be the fact that uh, all the ledge is present and you didn't want to damage the environment around it, it would be cost prohibitive and it would potentially damage the neighbor's property? Yes. Okay. So this is technically three stories, is that right? I mean, three living floors? Uh, no, it's two and a half, isn't it? I don't see the space for space. Is it, okay. is it the area? Is it, you got three floors of living area? There's three, three floors. There's three floors, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is my neighbor's house um, going back towards the fruit stand. So it would be to the west, I believe. Okay. And you can see um, that's the height. He's got two and a half, three stories. It would be on par with that. And we had approved two before? You had approved yeah. an additional story. It actually wasn't a full story, but it was a f another floor. Two floors from a single, single... I think it only took it up four feet, something like that, in elevation. The new version. New version. Three and a half. Was it three and a half? What about what about area, a uh, square foot area inside mm -hmm. the building? How does that change? Um, it's gone up like 300 square feet. It's under 2,000 square feet of living space. It didn't increase the footprint. Okay. Yeah. How about the area in the building? The area in the building, it would probably... I would say be a wash because, well, not a wash because he only had half a basement before because yeah. part of that was the garage. It was sort of like a split level yeah. before. Oh, okay. It was a split level before with the garage and then the basement first floor, the basement ceiling first floor was above the garage and then up to the second floor. Now <laughs> he's leveling all that out, one, two, and a little half story on top of that. Okay. So that the resulting difference was three and a half yeah. feet. I call it four feet. Right. Um, so that result of change from the original plan was three and a half feet. Yeah, and the, the setbacks didn't change from the original request. The, the uh, building footprint didn't change from the original request. Right. But it still was a different plan. Right. Um, he did reverse the garage from one side to the other. But that was just a mirror image. That was a mirror image, right. and the setbacks remained the same. Right. So, that I probably could have gone ahead and <laughs> worked with, but the fact that it's a non-conforming structure and increasing its height by another four feet, I felt needed to come back to the board. Well, and I agree. Adding that four feet <coughs> makes that livable space. We ought to know about that. I agree. I agree. Other questions from the board? The ledge issue... Um, just uh, we can actually I'll come back to that afterwards, and we go through the other next step. Any other questions from the board? No. All right. Why don't we go through the requirements and do again the findings of fact and conclusions of law? If we can do them together, great. If not, we will do them uh, individually. Uh, the needs of the variance is uh, due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Mr. Lazell, if you want to start, that'd be great. I think this one was uh, straightforward to me because of the shape of the lot. Again, it's a pie-shaped or triangle-shaped lot, which made it difficult for him to build without coming back for some type of variance. In this particular case, we had heard um, this one before, and he had gone up an additional four feet, it was j as it was just stated. So uh, it was right to come before us, but it's pretty easy for me to say okay because I think he's met the requirement on uh, question one. I would concur with Mr. Lozoyal. I, I don't have anything further to add on this question. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd have to agree. I, I think the property itself, uh, with the with the ledge that's that's in there, that, that pretty much restricts what he can do there. So I agree. I would I would agree as well. My uh, 
my points on this would be that the uh, the property, in fact, uh, I've never seen a property not on some kind of even you know even a piece of brick. Um, so, from for all intents and purposes, this thing's not going to last. Uh, so, from the standard of of the property itself and the ledge, uh, which I think is a big deal, because and and my guess is most neighbors as I would be very uncomfortable about having any blasting done anywhere near my property. Uh, you may better adjust that than I, Mr. Loisel, I think, or any of the other uh, engineers or builders here with experience to ledge, but I would think that would put an undue risk that is almost un undeterminable. Um, so I think that meets that, and I tie that in with the, uh, my position as far as the law, too. Anybody want to challenge or add to that? No. Okay. Uh, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or the fair market value of the abutting properties. I agree with that statement because if you look at the properties that surround it, they're, they tend to be newer. They've done more modifications in this area, and you're probably the last kid on the block that's making the move to, to upgrade the property. Uh, looking at the condition of the existing structure, it could certainly use some help, and uh, I think this will actually increase the value in the neighborhood. So. I would agree that uh, by bringing this, by upgrading the building the structure, it would be. Um, it would increase the value of the property and the surrounding properties around it, which would uh, add to the character, continuing character. I think there's a lot of character right now. <laughs> well, it's got a lot of character. A certain kind of Two character. Two by four construction, <laughs> yeah. floating on the on the ground. Yeah. Special character. Yes. I, I think to the contrary of what this states, mm -hmm. basically it's going to be a desirable change to the character of the neighborhood, um, as expressed by the people that we did have email us on that. Hey, I kind of mirror that. I, I think not only is it a, a positive change to the neighborhood, but I, I applaud you in the fact that you got the neighbors involved. Uh, you went to them first and, and got their feedback, and I thank you very much for, for, mm. for doing that. Thanks. And I, yeah, I agree. I, I think it will do exact opposite. It will definitely create a desirable change to the neighborhood, and um, going up a little bit doesn't didn't bother me, doesn't really have neighbors in close proximity to his structure and will be in keeping with other structures near him, so I'm in agreement. This to me is one of the rare properties that isn't, it's in Higgins Beach, but it isn't in Higgins Beach. Right, exactly. Um, so consequently, it's, it's got more leeway, I think, when we're looking at um, its presence, it, it's limited, and especially with the home being built beside it, that is actually set back. Um, that all ties nicely. We've got quite a bit of difference between the properties, distance-wise. We've got some nice trees in there. Uh, maybe Mr. Long's going to throw a couple of other trees in there. But I think that um, the uh, uh, the value overall it'll it'll help. And I, I like the fact that you've got your neighbor's support. In my opinion, that's probably one of the most critical components of any of these is getting your neighbor's support. Uh, so I would support uh, based that, and I would also tie uh, those comments as as part of the um, conclusions of the law. Um, the next one is the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Again, I agree with that statement because the the owner that's there now is there 20 something years. 23 years. So uh, it's been a significant amount of change that's happened since then including zoning, I believe has been modified in that case. So uh, this is not created by the owner and certainly is uh, is not an action that he's been involved in. I agree. Yeah, I don't have anything more to add to that. Yeah, clearly it sounds like it was uh, the cause from the original construction, which was well before that time, it just was never built properly. I agree. Nothing to add. I'm going to throw a challenge at that. Um, but more for just a documentation purposes. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a result of the action taken by the prior owner and the type of construction that they used. That being said, it is also consistent with the type of construction that was done at that time. So even though it is, the, I mean, the action is the, build, the, the person that built it put it on, a, on the ground. But it was never designed to be a year-round home. It was designed to be a... Jack. 
so I don't find that the, the, the primary owner did anything intentional to create the problem. It wasn't a problem per se. It's just the reality of 80 years of existence uh, in its style, so I'm okay sure. with that. Sure. Uh, the practical difficulty is not a result of action. I'm sorry. The, uh, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. Looking at the options that the applicant went through uh, with that much ledge that he would have to deal with, he had to weigh the risk and reward and the cost of doing any ledge blasting and the potential damage to the structures that exist around it. Uh, so there's definitely some liability in doing that. Looking at the size of the property and the building envelope, it's not like he can shift it to get away from that ledge. He's into it and cannot change that. Um, the existing structure was sitting on top of it, did not have a foundation because of, it was because of the ledge. So I think he's looked at what he can for his feasible alternatives. If you look at the size of the building, it's roughly, I think, 42 by 30, something along those yeah. lines. Um, so to fit it on that property is good. If it wasn't quite such a pie shape, it was more closer to either a rectangular or a square, which was potential, um, which doesn't exist, uh, it would have been much easier to fit it on there. And in this case, he just needs a small variance because of that. So I think, uh, I think he's done he, his due diligence in uh, trying to meet the feasible alternative question and test. I agree in that uh, I mean, once you discover ledge and then analyze the implications that it has on the neighbors, the potential um, issues that come along with that, it no longer becomes a feasible alternative and the, app the application as it currently stands before the board is a feasible alternative. Uh, I, I agree that it doesn't have anything else other than the variance. I don't um, know where I would express my concerns with going up because I do have concerns about that. I would like to see it be basically the same height as what the structure was as opposed to going up another three or four more feet. But I don't know where I express the concerns for that. I it's think it's really not location. part of this question. I, well, I'm okay with it there if you'd like. Uh, yeah. Please elaborate. I, I just, I, I would like to have seen it being built within what we had approved without going up further. We've, we've come across that down there, and I don't think we really need to go up further with structures. I'll bring that back to the other end of the table, because that is a different point. Anybody care to readjust their conversations on that point? Well, I'd like to hear the option of construction if you're going to do that. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there are alternatives. I mean, obviously, there was an alternative to what we are right. already approved. Right. And I think what he did, and, uh, well, can we get the applicant to speak yeah, to it? Sure, feel free. Can you go through the thought process when you lost the space in the basement, how you shifted it to the third floor, how that affected the design and the elevation change? So um, with the loss of the basement, I, I looked at the town uh, heights allowance, and I think it's 35 feet to the halfway point. Is, is that correct? It is uh, 30 Four feet? Four? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm That's okay. Uh, the, 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 to the halfway point, the height. How the, the height area. is measured? Yes. It's, it's to the midpoint between the eave and the peak of the roof. And yeah. um, that is, when you're dealing with a variance, under normal circumstances, that in a lot, it's fitting on a lot, that that is a buildable, normal, standard lot. All of those come into play. When you're dealing with any type of variance or condition around that, they don't fall into the same rules. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the board, based on its, its, the board can't exceed that necessarily, but they certainly could say they feel comfortable with that matching what the current guidelines are. So the answer is kind of in between. There, there are times when we'll approve something not to that standard. There are times that we'll approve it feeling comfortable with it. The reason why I'm comfortable with it is because it's there's nothing else within a reasonable distance. If this were on top of each other, it'd be a different conversation. So again, a lot circumstantial. When anybody comes to the board in general, and this is for anybody, it's the board. the The approval is not a gimme. The approval is not. You don't have an approval just because you have an approval. This is an opportunity to try and fix a problem that zoning has created. Uh, specific to the property. So, in essence, there's no right to anything. The right is to be able to come before the board and have the board hear you out. And then the right is, if you don't like that answer, to go to the Superior Court 
and deal with that. So there are rights in the process, but the rights for the approvals or how it's designed are limited to how the board feels it affects things. That's how I interpret it. Is that a fair interpretation of the code? Yeah. Um, just to clarify, the, the site plan with the application shows that there's a 33-foot, 10-inch setback um, from the side line closest to the nearest neighbor whose house Kevin showed on the, on the thing. So it's 33 feet away from that property line. It's also 30 feet 10 inches from the northerly property line, and and then the set it's the rear setback that's the tight the one that's tight and that butts up against conservation land where no one can build anyway because it's already conserved. <coughs> um, so the little impact the the impact of going from a single story structure to a two and a half story structure. It, you know, as long as the people are crying, I think you got a letter from the people across the road that yeah. weren't opposed to it, and you have a two-story structure beside you anyway, and I don't know what the one to the north of you, the nearest one to the north of you is, but it's it's far, I mean, he's well within that a 30-foot like setback on the sides. So and that's diagonally across the street? And the code, the code allows that was the one north, right? foot height. And that's so. Uh, and so I'd like to tie the, those comments as if, uh, as part of the findings of fact and um, conclusions of law, because I think that's relevant to this one, um, and it can be attributed to me as opposed to Brian, because I want it to be me. Um, but I mean, I think that, I think those points are consistent with what I'm trying to say, and so based on the fact that we're the voting on, voting members, I'm going to put that on Brian. I'll put it on me. I'm just pointing out which is what I, I which I think is perfect. And, and I'd, I'd have to agree with that. I, I think if this were in more of a dense area, I, I would have a, a problem with it. But because it fits the neighborhood, it seems to fit with the other homes that are in the area, and you're not right on top of each other. And the fact that by putting it on a slab, that actually brought it down, so adding the extra extra height didn't bring you above the 35, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I would agree completely. Okay. So and I and I think did, that, did that clear clarify for Mr. Crockett? Pardon, Mr. Crockett, how do you feel about it, that? It clarifies. I'm still probably it, in my decision, and will probably make no difference in my decision. But but it's a legitimate concern. I think it's an extremely legitimate point. So uh, the grand variance will have. I'm sorry. Uh, it will. Uh, yeah, you were good. Yeah. The grain of the variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. This is staying in the exact same footprint. There's no change whatsoever there. Pretty much except for what you've uh, granted me. Um, oh, sorry, if you look at the uh, site plan, there was some additional footprint granted. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think what he's trying to say is, are you saying is it the exact same footprint as the previous appeal? Yes. The pre previous yes. variance granted? Yes. yes. yes it is, is it the exact same footprint of the existing structure? Not exactly. Okay. He's, he's still under the 20% lot coverage. So he's meeting the 20% lot coverage, but, yes. but we approved previously. You approved a little bit. Right. The it doesn't, so it's, okay. Um, anybody else on those issues? No. Okay, Did you skip question five, Mr. Yeah. Chairman? The uh, granting variance will be, be bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. And, and I agree with that. If you look, he's um, he's go going from 2x4 two two construction into more modern standards. Uh, he's upgrading utilities. The sewer and water are no longer going to be on the ground. They'll be protected inside the building. Uh, flat roof goes to something with some kind of pitch. And uh, I think it's a general improvement. So yes, it brings it more in conformance with the existing properties. I feel it's a reasonable design, given its location. Um, and adjacent to the neighbors as well, it's surrounded by trees, and so it's not obstructing or causing any issues with the neighbors. It'll definitely be an improvement from what's there now, so I, I do see that as a positive. Yeah, I would uh, I would agree with what's been said, and also uh, the fact that it's not going to be sitting straight on the dirt with uh, with no foundation. I think that's a big, big improvement. I agree with everybody. Yeah, certainly will bring the. Um, the property more in 
conformity with the other properties around them that have been renovated already. Okay. And um, I would tend to agree with everybody's comments. Uh, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I think, again, this is an interesting piece because it's not a traditional um, Higgins Beach property. It's really, uh, it's just not. It's, it's, it's really completely different, so I'm fine with it. Uh, okay. So, anybody wish to add any comments, any uh, additions or findings that they feel irrelevant? One last question, one last comment. I think it was wise for both the town and the applicant to come forward with this because it could have created issues. So it was the right choice to do that. So I agree with in that. In the future, that, that, that is the right to thing me, to that, do. That it was absolutely the right call. Yeah. And, uh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's more expensive, but yeah. I think it's the right thing to do because yeah. the last thing you want to do is end up having a stop permit put on it. Mr. Chairman, I'll just add one thing to the findings, uh, just to remind the board, this was brought up the first time the variance appeal came before you, um, or the last one. Um, th this lot is so strange because it really does not have a building envelope because of the setback. Mm -hmm. it, it could meet them on the side, but the front setback basically yeah. eclipses any buildable envelope yeah. on the lot. Yeah. Yeah. So the septic system is on the side where there's room and it can exist within the setback, but the house can't legally exist within the setback. There is no building envelope for the yeah. house. So I just yeah. wanted to clarify that. It goes to, I think, number two, the uniqueness of the property. Thank add you. that into the record. I think that's important. Thank you. Yeah. And I would um, just commend Mr. Longstaff on his thoroughness when he's reviewing these things. I mean, I think it's a great asset for our town to have someone that's looking at all the details and making sure we're approving what's actually being built. <laughs> yeah, he's very helpful on this side of the table, too. I appreciate it. <laughs> Don't puff him up, too. <laughs> you, you, haven't, you haven't got your approval yet, Wade. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's lying. <laughs> I work with him. I know it's not he's that easy. He's cursed my name more than once, I'm sure. Um, other comments or questions or a motion? I move to approve uh, 2564 uh, as proposed. Seconded. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. No. Nope. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, 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 we do have one opposed. I'm sorry. Uh, so one opposed. And the opposal, uh, would you state for the record the reason for opposing? Um, just, I just, I think there is a feasible alternative. I don't know how to put it into what the question asked, but I'm just not comfortable with You're not comfortable with the added height? Right. right. I think it's important to get on record. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You feel comfortable with that answer? All right, Mr. Coyne, thank you. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Mr. Steph's going to run and get his computer as fast as he can. Okay. Agent
Okay. This appeal has been before us um, twice now. And the first time I was not here, I have watched both tapes again. Um, just for the record, um, Mr. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kaplan. Callan. Mr. Callan. Mr. Callan. Yeah. Um, represents Cameron Woodson. Is my also the firm that that I do my work with. Um, although I don't work with Mr. Callan, and I don't feel that that creates any uh, conflict one way or the other for me. But I want to make sure that uh, the board is aware of that. Does anybody have any concerns regarding that issue? No, whatsoever. Okay. okay. No. So seeing nobody with concerns on that issue. Uh, it's out there, and I guess from Mr. Callum's point of view, it also protects you because it's always that way, too. So. Yes, so thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. And, um, how would you like to start with this? Obviously, we've, we've been around this a couple of times. Is there a preference as to how you'd like to go about? I read your letter, I, I had a chance to study that. And I, I do have some issues with questions with that. Uh, I'll leave it to you to kind of set the tone as to how you'd like to present, and uh, we'll go from there if that works for you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am aware that the board has reviewed this particular ap application twice before, and then um, this this property even once previous to that. And so I know the primary question that the board's going to have here is, um, What's the difference with this application? Essentially, is it enough smaller? And I do want to promise that we'll get to that um, and uh, and um, kind of explain what we're coming back to, to you with and why we think um, we meet the criteria. Um, but I do want to take a chance to just um, back up in, in two regards. Um, the you have. Um, Mr. Longstaff has provided very helpful staff comments and the town attorney has provided a letter. So um, I do want to take a minute to uh, address um, the way those interplay with um, my letter. Uh, and I also want to kind of step back <coughs> briefly and just discuss kind of how we got to the situation where we are um, right now. Um, and so just by way of brief background, um, um, this property was before you for a uh, functional division um, in the early spring, late winter of this year when there was a previous property owner. Um, that property owner was looking to divide the two, the property to have the, to separate the two existing cottages. Um, during that, there was a lot of discussion. I think the board was trying to um, be very helpful to that property owner, um, one of the comments that the board said to the property owner um, that I think can characterizes the past practice of the board and, and part of what's the guiding principle for us here was um, it was characterized and, and said historically and practically what we have done is that if it's, if it's in the same footprint, so we're talking about um, in a situation, a tear down or rebuild like we have here, it's in the same footprint or it has moved to a better location and still the same square footage, this board has, I think, almost always allowed for that to be rebuilt in the same footprint. And if it's put in a more, if it's put more in conformance, that's e an even better reason. Um, and in the example of combining these two units together, it was suggested that uh, that the board would prefer to see that. Um, the advice, so that's been the guiding advice for um, both the, uh, the architect here as well as the engineer. Um, the advice that was then given right after that, I think, was, was probably the most prescient. Um, I think the way that it was explained was that when it was marketed as this, probably the thing that made the most sense would be to enter into a purchase and sale contract that was contingent on a variance and let the variance come before the board before the sale occurred. That was the one thing that didn't happen. Um, instead, um, the Daytons were in the process of looking for a property 
at Higgins Beach. Um, and as the board's aware, they were looking for a particular type of property because they have a, a 31 year old adult daughter who's disabled who, uh, who lives with them. And what they were looking for was a property that would allow them to have her have her own separate living space and them have um, their house at Higgins Beach. Um, and so the thing that drew them to this particular property was the very thing that is unique about this property in relation to all the others, and that's that there are two existing um, single family dwellings on the lot. Now, as the board's aware, a portion of this lot um, is within the shoreland zone. It's not anywhere close to the water in terms of setback. It's on the very edge of the outside of the zone. Um, what that means is because the shoreland zoning ordinance is more restrictive generally than the, the other ordinance, the, sh the more restrictive shoreland zoning provisions apply. One of those provisions is the fact that you can't have, that no dwelling unit can be considered accessory to another dwelling unit. Um, so that advice that I just kind of went through um, from the board in terms of their practice, that's been in the context of, of a, um, a hardship variance, which is the application that we have before you and the four criteria that the board is very familiar with. Um, I did want to, to point out and make one clarification, um, and it's a provision of the zoning ordinance that I cite um, at the beginning of my letter, and that's that um, you know, as the board's aware, the purpose of a hardship variance is when the language in the zoning ordinance doesn't expressly allow you to do something, then you come before the board and you can get relief from that language if you meet these four criteria. Um, and there was some talk previously about functional divisions in the Saco River case. Um, the, your shoreland zoning ordinance is actually um, expressed, so separate from and without a hardship variance, um, and without applying the Saco River case, um, what the ordinance says is that if two or more principal structures existed on a single lot of record on the effective date of this ordinance, each may be sold on a separate lot. And the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance is, is clear that it defines a single family dwelling as a separate principal structure. You can't have one accessory to the other. So while the previous applicant had come before you for a hardship variance, and what happened was that that was withdrawn. The board never acted on it or you know, denied it or approved it. Um, the, this particular lot and the two cottages by right can be divided as long as um, the provisions in section 12E2 of the ordinance are met. And those provisions essentially say that the, the two lots that are created are conforming to the greatest practical extent. So you're not supposed to have one lot. They're supposed to be basically even. But it's not a practical difficulty variance and it's not something that the um, that would require that sort of hardship variance from this board. Now that being said, the discussion that took place at that meeting in the late winter, early spring, um, raised a lot of issues on why it's less than ideal for Higgins Beach um, to have this separated in two lots because of the way that they're, the two structures are situated where one is in front and one is behind instead of being next to each other. Um, that it makes for a very difficult split in terms of the character and what happens to these lots. Those factors, well, they can come into play under the Saco River case when the ordinance doesn't expressly allow it. They don't actually, if you look at the shoreland zoning provisions in 12E2, that, that doesn't affect whether the applicant as of right can sell them on a separate lot. Um, it's expressed that they can. And so part of what we're here with on the hardship variance, um, we're here to try and get a practical solution in that both the board and the current owners of the property have, have, have said, look, it would be much better off for the town, the locality, and these particular owners if we can get one structure on the property as opposed to splitting these off into two separate houses. Um, right. Could you explain something to me to just tie yes. that uh, to 12E2? Uh, 
I interpreted that as uh, as long as they were buildable, as long as the lots were big enough to be subdivided. I didn't interpret it as being if you could do it uh, as a uh, two non-conforming lots. Do you see it differently than that? Yes. So if the if the lots are conforming, then you're not in Section 12 at all. Section 12, if you if you look, deals only with non-conformance. So 12E deals only with non-conforming lots. If you look at the the heading for 12E, if the lots are conforming, then you're not in Section 12. It's just you've got a conforming lot. There's there's an, it doesn't you don't need to have a building that existed prior to the ordinance. It just means that even if the land is completely vacant. You can have two lots that meet the dimensional requirements. That's just a matter of right. Um, this deals with non-conforming lots. And 12E2 deals with built lots. And it's expressed, the first, the heading is contiguous built lots. And the, and the first paragraph talks about two or more contiguous lots. The second paragraph isn't actually about contiguous lots. It deals with the similar situation, kind of um, legislatively adopting a standard that's similar to the Saco River standard, but is expressed in the ordinance where it says, if two or more principal structures existed on a single lot of record on the effective date of this ordinance, each may be sold on a separate lot, provided that the minimum lot size can be met. So here we're on sewer. But doesn't that come back to 12 MRS? Uh, MRS Sections 480, 4807-A through D. Yes, yeah, so that has to do with your wastewater disposal. That's the minimum lot size where if you're um, here, we're on sewer, so we don't have to it's have a certain size. For tied to so Not that that's relevant in this situation, but it's interesting, so thank you. Yeah, so, so what that gets to is the lots, the minimum lot size, you can't ever have a lot under state law that's less than 20,000 square feet. Um, that's, we're not nearly that small. Here, so um, the two lots, if they were split, would each be larger than 20,000 square feet. So that minimum lot size doesn't apply. So it's essentially that they may be sold on a separate lot, provided that they're more than 20,000 square feet if they're hooked up to sewer, as we are here. Um, and um, when such lots are divided, each lot thus created must be as conforming as possible to the dimensional requirements of the ordinance. So all it all it allows you to look at is. When you draw the line that splits the two cottages, you want neither lot to be way more non-conforming than the other lot. You want them essentially, it's already dealing with the situation where you know it's going to be non-conforming, um, but um, that's the only criteria that's applied, and it's not the four hardship criteria. So right now, we're not before you, indeed, it's you know, it wouldn't be before you on a hardship variance. We're not asking to split these lots, but I think it does frame the issue um, because it's it's important. All of the reasons that um, were talked about at that meeting as to why neither the board nor the the town or the area wanted to see these two lots. And remember, what happens there is each person independently, each owner with that existing lot has the right of the non-conforming building in its footprint. And if you can imagine, we're going to get to the, we're going to get to um, how small the footprint or the building envelope is here with the one lot. If you divide the two, then just like the other lot that you, that you previously dealt with, the building envelope disappears. It gets swallowed up by all of the existing setbacks. If you, when you deal with the, the front and rear setback on each lot. Um, so on this particular lot, um, as a single lot, as we're here today, Thank right? you for the clarification on that, by the way. Certainly. Um, the, the, the building envelope is just under 20 feet. It's like 19 and a half feet by about 55 feet. So for context, the, uh, the you know, and that building envelope has to include the eaves, right? So that's like a, at least a foot on each side, so you're down to 18 feet. For context, a single wide trailer is 18 feet by 90 feet. So you can't 
a single a single wide trailer won't fit on the existing building envelope and in fact you'd have almost half that the problem even if you tried to construct something in an a building envelope that small there's a reason why single wide trailers are one story and because you can't fit a stairway like a hallway and a stairway and have buildings and have two stories that are that narrow and um, they hit bridges what's that and they'd hit bridges right <laughs> well that's true when, when they're being delivered but um uh the <laughs> The reason that we're here, there's kind of an interplay, and I, and I apologize for skipping around, but I essentially want to save time for the board. The first and third criteria are really the only two I understand that the board has any concern with. And, it's, and what I want to just be clear about is that the issue with the first criteria, when I say the first criteria, this is the, the um, I apologize, let me just read the, um, this is, you know, whether the land in question can read uh, can yield a reasonable term without a variance. And the third criteria is the criteria that deals with the um, the essential character of the locality. And so, if I can summarize what my understanding, having listened to all the past discussions of the concerns of the board, the primary issue is the character of the neighborhood, and is the house too big or is it too tall? It bleeds in a little <laughs> bit to the reasonable return criteria, not in that anyone thinks that um, it seems the board seems clear that no reasonable return could be met if a dwelling can't be built on this lot. So variance of some kind is required, and the particular no, that's, no, that's, I have that's not yeah. Yeah. No. the the <clears throat> when you're talking right now. There obviously is a value because somebody bought it, right? Um, and if you, as you've done your, your homework on the notes, you'll remember that uh, the women both came up, said the properties were in wonderful condition, and uh, hundreds of people have loved it. And if only they could afford it, people would have bought it. Which kind of says, I can tell you why I didn't sell. Right. So, so, so there is a, a value there. So I, I right. want to make. So sure I apologize, that I'm, and I'm and okay. and and it's good. I I, I appreciate having the feedback back and forth because I think it will be more helpful to the board if I can answer your concerns and not answer right concerns answer. you don't have. Um, but um, we'll have um, some some pictures of the underside of the existing cottages, and we have packets that I'll pass out. And I apologize that they weren't in everything that um, you received in advance. Um, um, Mr. Wilson's going to have them up on display, and then we just had him make copies so that you'd each have some that uh, you'd have a chance to both see the inside and underside of the existing cottages, um, and then also um, kind of a more complete kind of up and down the street of the varying pictures of the houses and how they meet the, uh, those criteria. But I guess what I was trying to say is that the um, my understanding of the board's concern on number one was that you know you appropriately recognize the baseline that you're starting with is different when the lot already is improved it has value as it's improved here it's grandfathered non-conforming use and we know the zoning ordinance tries to eliminate those non-conformances to the extent possible which is why we've made every effort and actually succeeded in reducing the non-conformity of every existing non-conforming condition um, but what I was trying to get at it, the interplay between three and one, is my understanding is that the issue here is, are the applicants asking for too much, right? Or is it, is it too big? And the way you get to this, is it too big, is it's kind of like, is it too big for the neighborhood in that what they're trying to get is not just a, a reasonable return on their lot, but the maximum return, right? And we know that you're not entitled to the maximal, maximum return. What you're entitled to is, is a reasonable return on the lot. Um, and the board has, has suggested at various times, you know, essentially if we, if we could put something in this footprint at one story, then the board wouldn't have a problem with it. It's not the exact setbacks that are at issue or the exact footprint. It's kind of this concept that combines one and three together in a way that what we're looking at is based on what's there now and what kind of fits in with the neighborhood is what they're asking for reasonable, right? And so that's, to me, kind of 
how I see those two inter interplaying in terms of the board's concerns. And if, if you're okay, I'd, I'd like to kind of, if you're, if you're comfortable with this back and forth, I Absolutely. the board is comfortable with this back and forth, I, I think as long as it's tied through me, uh, I'm okay with this kind of concept. I like it. Is yeah. it a board comfortable? Yeah, with that? and I have input, but I want to wait for the right time. I don't want to interrupt your thought process and flow, so you let us know when it's time to. So, for, for instance, I, I would say one of the challenges with, with just taking the variance appeal, and as you know, the variance appeal, if you, if you sit through the classes, basically there's about nothing that can be approved in the variance appeal, which is frustrating for our point of view because obviously we're all community members and we all want to try and do the best we can. But that, that requirement is pretty high standard. So the, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. Well, the truth is, if you look at it the way it is, one could very easily argue, well, what are you talking about? Now, does this board use its collective intelligence to try and make things work as best as possible? based on those realities that we're tied to, I think we do. Um, so I, I, I got to be careful about getting words in there that, that so if you could be careful for me. Um, because Absolutely. I, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I, I basically, realistically, if you take this literally, the land in question as it sits cannot yield a reasonable return unless very screened. It's going to be a tough item to get past all by itself. Forget adding or tearing down or anything. I'm not saying we can't do that. I'm just saying that the reality is that's a big threshold, and based on the past history, it's been ugly uh, to get past that. Can I? Yes. And one of the reasons why I'm struggling with reasonable return, if you went back to that January meeting when we first met, it was the Lowell's, I think? Yes. Th that ha had the original property that came in and talked to us, and they were trying to figure out what they could do. And I remember I went back through the notes just to look and I went and watched the video and I remember I was pretty specific. I asked Mr. Fisher, had you considered taking both of the buildings and joining them? And he said no. And then towards the end we went off and talked about something else and again I asked, it was about joining the buildings. Why don't you just join the buildings so that the footprint stays the same, which is the point that Mr. Wilson has been making all along. Look, the footprint's smaller than what it is. And what I was envisioning when I said take those buildings and join them is you've got a one story and a one and a half story. You join them. Now you've got one structure that is anywhere between one and a half to reasonably two stories. And then when the proposal came forward and it was two and a half stories, it almost changes the whole landscape for me because I was thinking the footprint of this is going to stay the same, but so should the envelope. Now you've got a property that you didn't have a lot of value because it had two buildings on it, and if you take that same envelope, not footprint, and jam it together, you've got a pretty reasonable one or two family home. If you go up a little bit higher to gain a little bit more space, I get that. But when I see the footprint that I now see under the design and the, the usable footprint, the square footage, usable, goes from 1,700 square feet to more than 3,400, almost 35, that to me is now you're trying to maximize that profit. Because when I was talking originally in January, jam the two buildings together, now you've got 17 or 1800 square feet you're working with. If you raise the roof a little bit, maybe you go to 2000. But now we're talking 3400. To me, that's a huge difference. And let me just pause there for okay. a second before we continue. I'm using all of this information as part of our findings of fact, because it, it, as we go through this process, I think it's important. And your comments as well is finding a fact as we're talking yeah. about things. It's just a little bit different format. If the board's comfortable, if Brian's not going to scream at me, uh, I think at the end we're going to have to tie it all I together. I think you do have to go back and We'll have to tie it all again. But, but, but again, there's so much information here and there's so many things that's happened. And again, we truly try to do what's right by the community when we can. So go go ahead. I just wanted to get that. In and the I think it would have been easier help. for me to say no problem on the side sidewalks because it fits within the the characteristics and the reasonable return because it's not that big a structure on that small lot. Right. If that makes right. sense. Right. And so if I can, and I and mm -hmm. I think what the concern comes from, right, and the reason that it's 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 difficult applying these hardship variances in a place like Hagen's Beach is the issue you're getting at is. There are certain things you can do with a non-conforming building as of right, right? And then, you know, as soon as you get outside of those things, you're kind of tripped straight into, okay, now you've got to meet every requirement in the ordinance. 
The problem we have down at Higgins Beach is the way that the zoning exists currently and the way that the board has to consider it in terms of this application is that once you trigger that, um, you have to meet all the requirements, it essentially precludes having a single family home anymore. Right? And so that's why it, it's almost like everybody has to come and get a variance when they come here. And, it's, and so the board is in a very difficult situation of trying to, you know, the, the words of what you can do is non-conforming as of right mm -hmm. don't quite match up with, you know, what people are trying to do. And then the zoning as it exists don't quite match up. And so then you're in this, hardship variance and you know as we know the training is you know as because I'll I give that training and the training that I say is you know hardship variances should be if your zoning is right the exception rather than the rule instead here we're, we're essentially in this situation where we're trying to without being able to look at the words of what you can do non-conforming as of right we're trying to jam that concept into the hardship variance and it doesn't always fit very well. And so that's why I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the idea of what can we do and can we stick these two properties, uh, two houses together, I, when that an analysis was going on in the first instance, I don't think people were aware of the provision that I just talked through where mm -hmm. as of right, these two can be split and what can be done non-conforming as of right in the existing footprint is, is a lot more than what people were thinking at the time of just taking the two existing cottages and and jamming them mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So so the so that that kind of baseline that you're concerned about of like what is reasonable that we're starting with, um, I understand why you have that thought of just jam together what's there, but I do think that the fact that your ordinance expressly allows two lots and each lot to be treated separately as a non-conforming use that can be built out does raise that baseline a bit from where we're starting. And that's part of why I think we'll, we'll be able to show um, that what we're proposing does meet the criteria here. In particular, the, um, this idea of what's the essential character of the neighborhood when combined with this um, reasonable return. Are you asking for too much? Um, and so part of um, one of the things that I did want to focus on, because I do think that the, um, that the staff comments, Mr. Langstaff's comments are very um, helpful for the board, as is um, the, uh, the opinion from the town's attorney, um, uh, Phil Saucier. Um, and the, the one point that I wanted to make between the two, because I, I don't think we're really all saying that many different things. Um, the issue we're trying to make on this, uh, the point on the essential character, and this is both on the third criteria and as it ties into the first criteria, is that it's, it's important that it's guided by the rest of the ordinance requirements, that it's not kind of just out there, this concept of, you know, what would we like to see? Um, and there, the, um, the case cited by your town attorney, I think, is very helpful in terms of um, you know, what, what the town attorney says on this is, first he says there's very little guidance from the law, law court on essential character. And I think he's, he's right. There is very little guidance. Um, I do want to say that the only, the, the only issue that I have with staff comments is there's one port where I think he's just kind of recharacterizing this letter where he says, though the applicant's correct that the board may not use the dimensional standards contained in the ordinance not yet in effect, that there's no legal precedent that limits <coughs> what factors the board may consider in deciding if the proposal will or will not um, alter the essential character. And so that, and this, I apologize if this is just an attorney tripping up on words that mean something to me and it's an attorney that might not have been um, intended, but that, that there is some guidance and there is some legal precedent. And one of the ones is the case that's cited by the um, town attorney where the standard when they're and they were upholding the variance here is that when they were looking at whether other existing homes were as close to the street as the proposed new home. So this is, they were dealing with, here we have a setback from the street that we're, we need to grant a variance from. And the way we apply the essential character is, is that criteria that's being varied, when we look up and down, does, 
Um, well, having a, another house that close to the street changed the essential character. And there's actually another case that I think puts more express guidance um, on, um, on that point in particular. And this is an interesting case where uh, I think the board will find it really helpful. So I, I apologize to me, this ca the case law ends up being interesting. And if, if it's not, you can stop me. But the, the issue in this case was that the town had adopted, in this case, essentially a, uh, a special exception, um, which is you know different from a hardship variance. That would be, some towns call it a conditional use. I don't know what um, the, uh, it's called in Scarborough. Yeah. Um, and the standard that they gave for a special exception was um, was that the the use was allowed if it met the essential character of the uh, the area, right? And so what the what the court held in that case is they said, look, this determination of what is the essential character of the neighborhood is necessarily a legislative determination. It can't be given to the discretion of the planning board or zoning board. And so in terms of a special exception, it's unconstitutional for you to use that as a standard. And they go on to say, you know, to say, well, we're going to address why we allow that standard in the hardship variance since it's so similar. And essentially what they say is that, um, that that in the context of the hardship variance, when the court or when the board is looking at how to apply that standard, it, they say it would be the other provisions of the ordinance which would provide substantive guidance for the decision. And so, in what case was that? This is um, Cope, the town of Brunswick. What, what, what's the date on that? And it's a 1983 case. Nice. Um, and. Uh, and you'll note that the uh, the case that your <laughs> town attorney cited to is a 1982 case. These were very close in time when they're they're kind of struggling with this issue. And it, I think it is um, it is to a certain extent kind of settled that that's the difference. So well, you know, I agree that with the town attorney that we're given very little guidance. The guidance that we are given is that we have to look to the other provisions of the ordinance. And so that's why what, you, what you'll hear and what the, what one of the points that we've been trying to make on the, the height issue um, and whether or not this is kind of too big, the, the, the other provisions of the ordinance, the legislative determination has said that a height of 30 feet without any you know, increase in setbacks, a height of 30 feet um, meets the essential character of Higgins Beats. It's allowed as a matter of right. Right, and so I, I, I got to stop you. I don't, I don't follow that necessarily. I, I don't see that as a fact. I, I think that on, a, on a, a current lot that meets the the current zoning, that would be a true statement. But I can't say that that would be a true statement on a lot that's non-conforming. Do you disagree with that? Um, I. I don't know that I, I don't fully disagree. Um, I think that you're right in that if it's, a, if it's a conforming lot, then the board is never asked to apply that criteria. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where it comes up is that it's not so much the, the guidance that the, that the court's giving you is how you apply this criteria in a variance context, right? And you're not in a variance con context if it's a conforming lot, right? If, the, if it meets all the setbacks and, uh, and it's 30 feet, where it's 35 feet and it meets the kind of larger setbacks, the board's never asked to apply the um, essential character criteria. And so it's just allowed as a matter of right. So it, it's, it's true that the legislature, the legislative body of the town has determined that's allowed as a matter of right. But it's also true that when you're looking to understand how to apply the essential character, what the courts told you is you have to look to what the legislative body has said is allowed as a matter of right. And I think the only way to understand that is they're telling you that's what you're doing when you're in a hardship variance context, when you're applying the four criteria where we are here. So you're already in a situation where you're asking for a variance from something. And that's why I think that the language that the town attorney cites, and this is probably the best case there is out there that really kind of focuses 
just on this essential character issue. And when they are upholding them on that issue, the way that they do it is they say, okay, look, the board did this properly. What the board looked at was they said, what's being asked for here is a house that's this close to the street, right? If we look around, then are other houses that close to the street? Will having a house that close to the street there in the context of all the other components of the lot, right, in terms of like, is it a corner lot, is it whatever, you know, how do you <coughs> drive by it, all of those things come into play, so it's not, it's not clean cut, right? You're, the point that you've been making, I think, is a very good one to, to everyone that comes in front of you for a variance, a hardship variance, is that it's, you're not allowed this as a matter of right. So I'm not, there's a little nuance, I'm not saying the fact that, you know, there are other houses in the neighborhood that have this same setback means we're entitled to this as a matter of right. That's not true. If it were here, then, you know, it wouldn't matter what you said because I just, we could go up to the courts and they'd say, yep, yep, you're allowed to do it as a matter of right. So, but what the case law tells you is what you're supposed to look at and what you have to struggle with is does it fit into the essential character with regard to the particular things that are looking to be varied, right? Mm -hmm. And there are a number of them here. It's, it's not just the front setback, and it's the side setbacks, and it's the, um, the, build, the building coverage, the build, building area. And so that's why it, it is difficult, and, and I appreciate that the board has struggled with this. Can I jump in for a second and ask the board some questions on that too, and also um, yeah. respond to my, my first thought is, I just want to make sure I understand it. So when you're talking about the example of houses being close, not this property, just in general. You're talking about the house, you get five houses in a row and they're all six feet from the road. And you get one house that's 12 feet from the road and the court would say it's okay to go to six feet toward the road. Is that, is that in simple layman's terms what you're saying? Um, yes, but what I want to be clear about um, is that it's not the court that's saying that. It's not as a matter of right. It's not even in that case. Right in that in that case, because for instance, if you have a vacant lot, as you sometimes have, that's kind of what you were saying. You know, if you've got a vacant lot and you got a bunch of houses up there and you need to put a new house in, um, and you're, you know, the the other case that your attorney cites, the Summerwood Cottage case, that actually was a, a variance that you guys upheld at Higgins Beach, in the or a variance, a hardship variance that you guys granted that the court upheld at Higgins Beach. Um, I, you know, I think gives some helpful guidance in terms of what you're looking at, right? In some instances, a vacant lot, depending on where it is, if it's in front of the water and if, and if it's owned by someone that has back lot property, it might be enough that you can just set up a hammock there and enjoy the view, right? They've said that in some cases can be a reasonable return and so, um, and allow a hardship variance. And I, and I want to just be careful that you have to find each of these things, um, but they, they do, as we're seeing here, like one and three kind of mesh together. And so the, the court's guidance on them, and like the Summerwood case, they don't necessarily kind of, they pay lip service to each one, <coughs> but they're not saying it's like you analyze each one completely independently. They kind of blend together. And so in that case, um, what they what they were looking at is they said, look, yeah, this is a vacant lot, but it's different from this other case where we held that a vacant lot down by the water you can just recreate on. There, based on kind of where it is and what's around it, um, the board was was right in you know you, what it, the court upheld them saying the the findings led the zoning board to conclude that there was no reasonable return without a house on the property, right? So that's kind of where they were. Um, and so the, the issue is um, would you, you know, in the context here where you'd be making a similar conclusion that, that there's, uh, there's not, you know, essentially no reasonable return without a house of some kind and you were going and you were looking and finding that in the neighborhood there are houses that have similar setbacks and lot coverage um, then that would be the proper analysis, I think, just like in the Summerwood case, you would be upheld on that. Now, 
if we show you all that are we entitled to this as a matter of right such that if you denied us we'd be able to go and get the court to flip you that's a much you know that's not as clearly the case right you guys your role you you can't be what's called arbitrary and capricious you, you can't treat one property owner different than all the others this board works very hard not to do that right this board does a very good job of kind of approaching all of the applications in front of them and trying to get to a reasonable solution so the board is justifiably struggling with how to deal with when these kind of non-conforming uses butt up against these hardship variances um let me stop you there because i know that this one's <coughs> something i know some of the other board members did too yeah. and then we'll kind of <coughs> okay well i just wanted to bring up the point that one of your esteemed colleagues so eloquently a few months ago pointed out to me is that this was a shoreland zoning overlay and so we we have to consider not only the shoreland zoning regulations but also the underlying zone regulations so when you start to talk about um, uh, 12e2 we can look at that but not the entire lot is in the shoreland zone some of that lot is in the other zone and in our regular zoning ordinance we deal with nonconformances in a much different way. So you have those two things interplaying, okay? The other thing is that because it's an overlay zone, we have to pay some credence to the underlying zone as well, and we deal with nonconforming structures in a different way, where elevating those structures or raising the, the roof of those nonconforming structures is also, it, it, it requires a variance. So but you can't, you can't just look at shoreland stuff. I think there's also been a few miscalculations in the shoreland zone with regard to building area in the shoreland zone because I don't think the additional floor areas were, were calculated. I think they were dealing with footprint. But you have to deal with living floor area, not, not just footprint. So, so there's, there's some discrepancies there that I think we need to get to at some point. Right, and I hope we will. And I think that's, I agree with you, the point that I was trying to make, we're not, um, the non-conformance stuff is what you can do as a matter of right. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the overlay zone aspect means that there are provisions of each that come into play. But that's the more restrictive. The overlay zone in this, usually it's the shoreland zone that's the more restrictive. In this particular instance, it's the underlying zone that's more restrictive. Right, well, I would disagree in, in just a, in a little bit. and. Uh, and I'll explain it just to try and put a point on it. And I think my, I'm, I'm not sure which fine esteemed colleague that you were referring to. Not from your um, firm. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think it was a compliment, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the outside of the um, shoreland zone, uh, the functional division is dealt with with the Saco River case. That's something that the law court has de determined kind of as uh, the, that the imposition of zoning over built lots when it meets the criteria of Saco River, which aren't quite as clear as 12E2, that it's allowed as a matter of right. Um, but the In very the thing, River. right? The sock, right? But the the issue that they were dealing th that they were dealing with there, and the primary issue that you would be struggling with under Saco River is essentially, um, were these two buildings kind of accessory to each other, or were they actually separate principal structures? And that issue is dealt with in the more restrictive way that's answered by the shoreland zoning that it can't be. You can't have a dwelling that is accessory. Um, to itself, so it actually, um, because the shoreland zoning ordinance is more restrictive as to the definition of dwelling, um, because one of the two dwellings is in the shoreland zone, it doesn't allow it on a lot, when you're dealing with a lot that combines both, to be accessory to the other. And, you know, and the board's looking back and forth, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because we're not here, you know, essentially, that may be an issue we have to struggle with if we can't come to a, a resolution with, with you all on what meets the hardship variance, where I think that it's pretty clear that it would be allowed as a matter of right that these two lots could be split. And I, and I understand your point, um, and 
I don't know if I was making sense in terms of the, the reason why I don't think the way you were reasoning it out would apply. I think but I don't. I also just I don't want to waste too much yeah, time. Yeah, no, no. I, neither, so. nor do I, because I know the, the board members have questions too. I, I think that's a point of contention, and I think it will remain a point of contention. And I think it's probably okay because we're not really talking yeah. about that, yeah. right? But but, but I do think <laughs> I do think it does inform the the issue that we're dealing with in terms of of what's reasonable here, because the other outcome is that you do deal with two separate lots. And so if, I, if I'm right and they can be split, then you know, both now in terms of what's allowed is legally nonconforming and you know, in, a, in, a, in a couple months or a few weeks or whatever it is when the new ordinance changes where the, the building envelope issues disappear and what would be allowed on each of those lots if they can be split as a matter of right is a whole lot bigger, then it really, you know, this is a situation where in some circumstances you could say, all right, well, if, that, if the property is worth more doing that, why don't they just go and sell it and do that? But the, the issue is, you know, they pick this lot for a reason, not because they're trying to maximize their return. They have a, they have a, a disabled adult daughter that needs her own living space, and the fact that the board had said, look, we'd much rather see instead of this being two lots, because remember, the board didn't even conclude when they thought they were dealing with Saco River that they couldn't do it. Um, the, it, I, it think, I think the board, at least my position was that we... Yeah, we were pretty sure we couldn't do it. Right. And that's uh, why we offered that other possibility, but it was only a possibility that we offered. There was no yeah. specifications or conditions placed on that. Right. So I would, again, respectfully contend that that was not a foregone conclusion. Okay, today. and yeah, and I guess the point I was just making was that the board took no action on it, I guess. It right. was, it was withdrawn. Yeah. So no, it was yeah. withdrawn. We didn't right. have exactly. to. <laughs> and so, so the issue would be, you know, if the board had taken action on it, then whether or not that I was right or wrong, it was decided and it wouldn't have been appealed in time. And but but the issue is, the lesson know, is that somebody should always have an attorney when they come to the zoning board. <laughs> or the lesson is actually, I think that that someone should have an attorney or someone with your sage advice um, when they're purchasing property like this. People don't understand, unlike you guys who deal with these hardship variances, that it's not something that you can kind of expect. So the so the real issue here. Um, and the mistake that was made to the extent it was made was just, you know, when the Dayton's found what they thought was the perfect property that would allow them to do this s second dwelling unit for their ad adult disabled daughter, and the sellers were like, thank goodness, we finally have someone that wants to do this. It should have been that the contract was drawn up that let the board review it and everyone kind of come so that you'd have both the, the seller's issue on whether they can get a reasonable return based on the way that they're selling it and the buyer's issue, you know, because part of what you'd ordinarily do is you'd say, well, no one would buy the property unless they could do this. And here, the, the only reason this property was bought was because they mistakenly thought they could do this and didn't, as you said, kind of make the contract contingent on coming to the board first. And when they, if they found out that the board wasn't going to approve this, backing out of the sale, which... I think the lesson there is that they do wish that they had an attorney to advise them on that. But we're not at that point, and right now we're trying to kind of solve the problem and be practical on where we are right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so with but that, I don't... Can I just stop because I know I've been dominating, and I want to make sure the other board members have an opportunity to share their views. And Again, it's all, as long as you're fine with this model, I'm okay with continuing it. If you feel like it doesn't, and... Uh, the board is fine. I'm okay with continuing this path. Mr. Chair, my question is, should we go over the questions and open it up to public hearing and then have some discussion back and forth so we can hear what the public has to say on the matter as well? So we can go through the questions. What's the board's preference? Normally what would happen is we'd allow the, the applicant to go through their, their process and then we'd go and open the public hearing so that they've heard their complete position. So, so my we preference do that process? Would be I think rather than going think back and forth with the questions, I think we should do the process then. The advantage of the back and forth <coughs> is because there are so many layers that are out there. For instance, this whole thing with the division is truly irrelevant when it comes to this case right now. However, it is a great dialogue that by answering these questions, I, I think there's some credibility factors. I think that uh, the attorney and we still don't know where the appellant's going with this so right. I think we're right. peaking too early so
So, Mr. Chairman, perhaps I could suggest, because I was going to say exactly the same thing, I think at this point it might be appropriate for me to turn it over to Mr. Wilson to, to show the, the pictures, both the existing cottages inside, because I, I do think that the, the public w would probably want to respond to kind of what they see is different here. So um, if it's okay with the board, I'll, I'll let him come up and kind of explain what he's done differently. Um, and then we can go back maybe to this question and answer as part of the deliberation to the extent that works. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So, uh, great. <coughs> I request uh, respectfully that you go through the process. I think it's going to be a long meeting. Uh, that you get your, because we don't think the design is that much different, at least what I've saw. Get the points out that we don't know about and don't not. I don't want to dis. I want to make sure you cover all your points, but some points have been covered to death. So I want to make sure you get everything covered. But please respect the, the time and the process because it's a, they're going to have other people want to speak to. I think. So I'll suggest the, the three things that I think that we're we we're hoping to present are one kind of the state of the existing cottages because there was some question as to that in terms of of you know. Um, I think Mr. Fisher said if you ran it, then they could fall down. We have some pictures underneath to just, and to just show what's inside, because that kind of sets the baseline of what's there now. Um, the, the next issue will be kind of the, the changes from the other application. In particular, one of the issues I know that the board has struggled with is uh, how to deal with this attic space and you know considering it a story or, or not, or and whether or not you know that's necessary to kind of fit the mechanical stuff because we're up on pilings and we're not allowed. Just a heads up, I don't think that's what the board was feeling. I want to kind of kind of tie that back okay. to you because I think that's one of the flaws in the process. Uh, listening to the tapes and like I said, I wasn't at the first meeting. I was at the second meeting. I listened to both. I walked through it. What I heard was the board was just saying it's not about floors. We got into this whole floor thing, which really wasn't the point. The point was. It was just too big right next to another home. And I think that it ended up becoming a debate of floors, and, and it, that got us nowhere, obviously. So it was bigger it, or okay. lesser than what it appears. Is that a fair summation for the board? Sums it up for me. Okay. So I just, because I don't want to get wrapped around with it. Right. Or not. I think that makes sense. So the, the two, we've got a couple sets of pictures that I just want to pass out and then uh, a bulleted list. And I'll pass it out while Mr. Wilson takes over because he's going to, because he's going to actually have them up here and use them as a display. So I'll just walk them down the line. That'd be great. And I can see why uh, Mr. Shanae thinks a lot of you. <laughs> um. This first plan is the existing conditions, which I think we all know. Front cottage, back cottage. Both cottages occupy 1,740 square feet of the property, uh, roughly around 35% of the lot coverage. Thank you. And this is the... This is the proposed lot coverage we talked about. A couple minor changes that you might have, not even affecting the house. We did move the driveway in a couple feet from the property line to get it off the property line. Uh, basically, the site plan is the same as before as far as the um, size of the building goes. When you're talking about the size, you're talking about the footprint? I mean the, uh, lot coverage. Okay. Yeah. In the front of the house, we did make a change in this roof shape. Before it was a gable front, straight up. We turned it back to a hip roof, so we get some less vertical height on the front of the building. And it's basically the two-story with a hip roof instead of going up with a full frontal gable. Uh, the other thing we did is on the back entry of the house, there was some current concern at one of the meetings about the home office over the rear porch. We took the home office out of the floor plan. <coughs> That's not there anymore. 
Is the is the structure still there though? I'll show you in a second. So on the second floor we actually had this area was all finished off before. Over the porch. We eliminated that. And before this whole section, the roof came all the way back to here. So that was to cover this office where it came out. Well, the office space was eliminated, so we could pull the whole rear roof line back further. Uh, so now we have a, a two-story front with a roof at this height, which has a, uh, a building height of 26 foot 4 inches. The middle section is 28 foot 2 inches in height. And over here, we're about 24 foot 6 inches in height for a building height. This little section right here is where the stairway goes up into the attic. And that's got a building height of 29 foot 10, less than the 30th day we're talking about. <coughs> because in the R4 zone, if you're more than 30 feet, it, it establishes a dimension for your setback from your lot line. So we're less than the 30 feet at just this space. The other space is 28 foot, 26 foot, and 20 foot, 25 foot high in building height. <coughs> so that was a change also in the rear of the building. We pulled the roof in 10 feet and the second floor in 10 feet. So the facade on this side is a lot less than it was before because this building sits back from this building by 10 feet, whereas before it came straight up. So we've cut the facade, that length of the facade on this side, changed the height of the roof in the front of the building. That's basically what we did in the building. Now, like I said, the setbacks are the same as before. We haven't changed that. This you have pictures of that you got today. This is the existing two cottages on the property. This is the front cottage, this is the back cottage. Um, let's look at the rear cottage first because it's nearest to me. As you can see underneath is nothing more than open crawl space with old timber curtains. Floor joists in this cottage and in this cottage are the same thing. Two by six is two foot on center. You got sagging beams, and you got sagging floors. You can see where they've tried to shim it up over the years. And uh, the old posts originally were just plain cedar posts. We replaced them with some four by fours and four by sixes to shore it up. But if you look under the floor, see those floorboards right there. The whole flooring in the house is only one layer thick. That's also the finished floor of the house. You can see right down through the floor. The ceilings of the house. This is the living room in the front cottage. Open ceilings, open wiring, open studs, open switches with wiring coming down. Uh, two by six is 30 inches on center for floor joists. The studs are two by four, vary anywhere up to 30 inches. Uh, the front porch in the rear cottage is here. They're two by fours. Uh, it's 36 inches, uh, 38 inches right here in span. And then it varies down to like 16 inches on those spans. And the other cottage, same consideration, even though it's dark pictures. Open ceiling joists, open stud walls, open wiring, and uh, a lot of it's the old uh, knob and tube wiring too. So the structures themselves are there. A lot of work you could fix them up. In an extreme amount of work you could put a second floor on it. But in either case, <coughs> new foundation, newer reinforced floor systems, walls, roofing, new windows, insulation, there isn't any in these, new electrical, new plumbing, new roofing, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the cottages are not in the best of shape. Okay? Uh, I know that was one of the concerns that was asked last time. You know, if you go to tear them down, you got to prove the rest are worth to be tear torn down. I think that does that. Now,
This is a series of photos, primarily Vesper Street photos. And uh, the intent of this is to show other houses on the street and in the vicinity and how they relate in a way to what we're proposing so you can get an idea what's going on. Um, excuse me a minute. Just to orientate you, his ocean coming in, Bayview, and uh, Vespa Street is right here. This house sits right in the corner, Bayview, and Vespa. This is the house that's approved by the board. <clears throat> this lot is uh, the old house is here, changed around, new house put in. It has 1,145 square foot of coverage on the property. So it occupies 47% of the lot coverage. And it's a full two stories high. Okay. The second house up, which is diagonally across from this house, the house is 67 foot in depth from the street to the back. Um, <coughs> and it occupies roughly 27% uh, of the lot cover. But the depth is here. It's also interesting to note the first house in this one, straight two story front, and this house is a straight two story front. This house sits back two feet from the road, very close to the street. As you go up the street, here we have a house, this third house up directly across. The house has been newly renovated. Can you see the cameras? It, I don't have the exact size on that. Let's stop it for one second. These are, the cameras over here are a little bit easier to see if you want to come up closer, feel free. I don't have the exact size in the house because it was newly renovated and has the tax maps. That was a one-story house and they made it one and a half, put the dormer straight front and the table in front. The house that's next door to the, to the lot we're talking about, at, uh, at, uh, 21 best, 23 best, I'm sorry. 21 or 23? 21. 21. 21 best, right, 21 best. This house that's there now is 45 feet in depth. Okay. The next house up to this one has a depth of 54 feet and it has a square footage lot coverage of 32%. Right? Yep. 2,570 square feet. Right. Yeah. Yep. Now, this is the house that was on the <coughs> going up faster. 24 that's been just redone. Now this is on a lot that's 125 by 100, and it's probably going to be divided in half to very strong. So the square footage on that is kind of hard to say because what's there now versus next spring might be entirely different. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> and going through this, you're going to see there was a whole vast design of houses. They go from ranch houses to split foyers to older bungalow type, to the more modern type, to every type you can think of on the street. Lot 27 in Bestwood has a depth of 57 feet, occupies 34 square feet of block okay. Then there's this ranch house, which sits way back from the street. But it's got a one-story lot coverage of 1,815 square feet. So the square footage of the of the lot of the house on the lot is over 1,800 square feet. Going up on Vesper on the right hand side, we get 20, 24. I can't see the angle here. 29 Vesper. That has uh, the front structure, a back structure, on a bigger lot, um, but it's got 2,102 square foot of lot coverage. The structure. This house, the kind of nifty little house, because it sits on a big lot, and it's not a very deep house, um, and it's on a lot that's going to be divided probably. 
There's a 100 foot point engine that sits off center on one side. Sooner or later, it'll get divided. Um, so it's hard to say what that water coverage will be versus is now. Then you hit a split foyer type house going up on the left. <coughs> this house, I don't have a picture of it right here, but this is the house that sits way down towards the marsh. It's the one, it's the oddball one that sits out in this corner past it. <coughs> and that's got a double shed roof type look to it, but it's also got uh, 1,613 square feet of lot coverage. Got one more to go. As you're going up Vesper, you get to uh, 34 Vesper. Front building, back building. Total combination of 2,151 square feet of floor curve. The house across the street, 36. What's the percentage on that? 26% of the larger lot. Go across the street and at 35 Vesper, you have a house that's 31% lot coverage and has uh, 1,472 square feet. Uh, the next house up, again, this one was approved by the board. This one was approved by a board, your board. I brought in uh, 1236 with 25% lock coverage. And this one's heading up at the end of the top. The top has got two buildings on the property. Got a total of 1,675 square feet of lot coverage, and there is a little bit of lot, so it's 26% lot coverage. This is one that was done at the corner of Vesper and Champion, and the reason I included this one is because it's 35 foot in height and it's 34 foot to the top of the roof in height. This one is also in Champion, and the reason I included that one is that it's only about 60, it's on this lot right here at the end of Champion, and it's only about, um, on the diagonal about 65 feet away from this lot, so it's relatively close. And this, this house is uh, 49 feet deep, but occupies 1,680 square feet of lot coverage, and about 27% coverage. So what I've done, I've highlighted these yellow spots to indicate what buildings are either larger or have relatively the same size square footage or a square foot lot coverage about the same or larger than what we're proposing. Did you also do area? <coughs> What's that? Did you also do the, the, the now the taxes are done based on living area. Did you do those numbers also or? Not on living area. You're I'm just doing not, plan. This is just talking lot coverage and, <coughs> and percentage of lot coverage. I just wanted to have that information. No, I don't. Not on, not on all these. No worries. Okay. So what, the, what does this show? It shows that The building lot coverage that we're proposing in square footage is 1693. The existing lot coverage on the lot is 1740. Now there's five properties on this street out of 18, out of 19, including ours, but 18 different ones. Five of them have relatively the same amount of lot coverage, uh, building lot coverage, or more. 29 Vesper has 2,100 square feet. 28 Vesper has 1,800 square feet. 33 Vesper, a little over 16. 34 Vesper, 2150. And 24 Champion, 1680. Well, I don't think we're, we have a trouble with lot coverage, right? No, I know we don't, but it, they're all, it's all getting into something here. Okay. So I just okay. want to kind of remind you that that's not one of the right. issues we're worried about. Right. But it comes into what Dave was saying. These things kind of melt together, okay, when you're looking at... Yeah, but, what we're but, but that's not that's not tied to again. I'm trying to keep it moving. At the same time. I don't want to cut you down. I don't want to cut you off. But I, I want to keep the task of where the where we know the issues are. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody's got a problem with lot coverage. Okay, no um, one's got a problem with lot coverage. I, but there was at the last that. meeting. There seemed to be a coverage in the depth of the house of what we're proposing to the depth of the houses I that the other ones were in the street. I think it was more scale. I, I think scale is the magic word. Right. Uh, and again, I don't want to cut you off, so please get what you need to get out. I don't want to okay. say that yeah. you didn't get your well, let's thoughts out scale. Though, These are houses on Vesper Street. All you got to do is look at the pictures. This is three stories on Vesper. 
What number is that? This is three stories in the corner. I'm sorry, what numbers do you got? Well, what numbers are those? That one's... Uh, if you got a page number, that makes it easy. Uh, 34, Vespa. That's number 13. That makes it easy. Okay. Number uh, 16. 16. Yeah. Um, 17. Number 17. Now, did you do 34? Is that one of your jobs? Or is that ever done? Did you do one of those? Is that 34 one of yours that you did? 34? It just looks like one of them. Uh, we came in the board with that, yes. Okay, and, so uh, We got approval to do some uh, remodeling to it in addition on the back. Okay. But the height was the same, right? The height's the same. I right, just remember that one. I, you can tell yeah. your style. Okay. Yeah. I'll see um, and then again on both. Uh, 37 and... 35, of course, the land drops off to the back and you walk around to the back and they're a lot taller houses. See it either? Uh, we also would approve this one. Which number is that? I'm sorry. That's number 17. Page 17. 17. Now, that again, that was at that height, though, correct? You no. That went up? That, we added a story to it. I don't remember that one. We added a whole story to that one. Okay. Um, the same with this one. This was... This height right through the other story. Which one is that number? Number uh, 57. Number What's the page number? Yeah, 15. 15. 15. We're kind of simple here. 15. Okay, 15. We, we can do a 15. <coughs> the 15 is, is... Okay, good. I mean, 15 would be something that I like, so that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. And that was, we added this whole backstory going to the back of the house. And that house is actually about 56 foot in depth. Now, there are varying styles of houses on the street. I agree. I think it's obvious split for your um, a one and a half story uh, New England with dorm as a ranch house. Uh, an old bungalow. And here a house you can see has been added to and added to. And that house is 57 foot in depth, just three houses up from what we're proposing. Um, Chair, if I just ask a quick question. Sure, feel free. Um, I was just wondering, with all the properties that you've got that you've looked at, was there any look at 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 25 houses that are on the same side of the street as this one? I know you've got 21 and 23 in here. Right. But I don't see any of the others. Was there any look There's at some any? skip numbers on the street. They, they don't include every night, every number okay. is not included, in, you know, not numerically. In so all, all the ones that I've referenced, you, you there, skip there's numbers. probably not houses there? There's, there's no lot number that's in order. It goes from like uh, 18 <coughs> to 20 on the left side, then it skips to lot 24. So 22, 23, 21 don't exist as far as the uh, address goes. Okay, I thought 21 and 23 were in here. I'm sorry, 21 and 23 are on the opposite side of the road. I'm talking even numbers. 18, 20, and then goes 24, so it skips a lot, 22. And then from 24, it goes to 28, with uh, number 26 is missing. As far as on the side where 19 is? What what lots are skipped on that side? Is there is there a 9, 19? 11, 13, 15, 17? No, it starts at 15. And goes the up to 19. Okay. You want to look right up here. So, I can't see. Yeah. address wise. Um, okay, so it starts at 15. Then. Yeah, and then goes to 19. And just and one other point of clarification the two existing buildings have separate Which numbers, one? so both so 17 and 19 are, are on this one. Right. Okay. So, anyway. So, between this house 17 and 19, <coughs> there would be 15 and 21, correct? Exactly. So, there's two houses. Exactly. So there's there's some address numbers that are skipped. Okay. Okay. That helps me out a little bit when I'm looking at these numbers. I thought I was missing a bunch of numbers. This is 19. And now you get to back at the bottom of Vespa on the house directly across the street here. This is on lot number uh, 18. Uh, that's the one at 67 feet deep. goes back and it goes up to three stories in the rear right across the street. Again, the one in the corner, this is one that was approved, I think, about th two or three years ago. Uh, the remodel of this, um, where we changed the 
second floor quite a bit because it was just a story and a half with a cape roof. We made it the two full story. So there's history on the street of enlarging houses and of houses of roughly the same depth and size. Um, we aren't trying to maximize the biggest house on the street. But one thing we do have here that these houses don't have. These are all one family houses. And we're one family plus the other apartment. The one family house is actually only 45 feet in depth from the street. A lot less than all these houses which are all one family. What makes this house deeper is the second unit which we are allowed to use because we're grandfathered in the second unit. But can, I, can I stop you there because I'm not sure it's a totally accurate statement. If, if this is being redone, then that grandfathering goes away, doesn't it? Not exactly. It's because there's been the use of the lot has been for two single-family dwellings. I Com think we've we've established that that combining them would allow for two units. You're not changing. You're not making. The, you're not changing the use. Okay. The current use of the property. Right. How you do that is a, a different issue. Okay. How you accomplish that is a different issue. If you simply tore each cottage down and rebuilt them and got, got a variance to rebuild them in their place, that would be one thing. Probably, I don't know. I mean, that would be one way of doing it. And, and this is quite a different way of doing it. So not changing the use, it's changing how you get to the use. Thank you. Now, and to that point, what the existing situation is, if you look at all the houses on the street, What's there existing right now is more non-conforming in appearance and aesthetics than all the other houses on the street. The one okay. variable we don't know just for the it is what they started as, which is hard. That's to right. Say. We don't know what they started as. Uh, this so one's just getting started late. We don't. We don't <laughs> know where they started. You know whether they increased it or not increased it. We don't know. We just don't know. Which is which is one of the challenges, obviously. I, go ahead. I, go ahead. You're doing great. I can see that. Okay. So what I'm getting at here is that these are all one-family houses. On our proposal, the one-family portion of the house is only 45 feet in depth. Now, the 18 houses I'm showing you, 15 of them are deeper than the one-family portion in the front of this house. They have more depth to them. Um, and like I said before, the, the second unit being brought into the house is the only reason that makes the house longer than the other single family houses. Is this total 67.4 for yours? Is this total 67.4 for yours? 67.4? What yeah, the it's, it's something like that, yeah. Yeah. Is that the total? Link. Your length. Your length. Oh, the length, yeah, 67 foot, basically. So yeah. it, it would be the largest house on the street if it's 67 yeah, foot. The one across the street 67 feet. So it would only take four inches off, it can take four inches off the house. <laughs> no, I just wanted to clarify if it was right. going to be the largest but house. Don't forget, the that's a one family, and that's a two family length. It's a big difference. I'm not sure that's relevant in our case, but it's well, an innovation. <laughs> okay. So we, we, we get it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure that. It's a, a legal definition of, of the reason. Okay, so I'm going to skip off the, the sizes and the square footages and all that for a minute. Thank you. Um, <laughs> on Vesper Street, talking about setbacks from the front street, like I said, first house up on Vesper is um, 18. It's two-foot setback in the front. This house right here has a two foot front yard setback. The next house up has nine foot front yard setback. The house next door is nine foot eight front yard setback. We're proposing to be ten and a half to the roof overhang and eleven foot, just over eleven feet to the building face side. Um, so pretty consistent. Bringing in the existing setback was uh, ten feet to the building and four and a half feet to the stairs. We're orientating this parallel to the lot line, so we're bringing the stairs way in. So the building outline used to be that. We're eliminating that increment in the front of the house. Okay? Now, if you go up on, 
on Vespa, there were at least three other properties that were with less than 10 foot front yard setback. But, but I just don't want to, I'm not trying to be difficult, but again, <coughs> we're talking about this specific property. Right. I don't think any of us disagree that a lot of change has been done, and I'm not trying right. to, oops, but when we, when, I don't so, want us to get bogged down in the garbage so that we end up nowhere. And I think we'd all agree that there's a mismatch of some people think it's right. great, some people think it's okay. I think lot frontage is consistent with everything else. I think the size is consistent. I think right. you ultimately come back to volume and, and, and reasonable return. I think and and how it sits compared to its, its existing reality to its new reality and how that affects the neighborhood and mm -hmm. and that's the only you know that's when you're looking at the four criteria you're looking at a reasonable return I think the second one is yours I think the fourth one is yours the third one and the first ones are where I think you've got your battle and and that's my opinion again I always fall back on that as you know but where I <coughs> the battle is. <coughs> Reasonable return and impact. Um, what's the exact wording? Uh, I know. I know what you're talking. Essential about. character the reason, of the locality. Mark, the reason I brought all this up is because when I left the board last time, all I heard the house is too big, it's too deep, there's too much depth, and everything's too big. So the whole reason of this is to show other houses on the street, the immediate street, are as deep as this, and they're all one families. And we're two families. I wanted to bring that to the attention of the board because when I left last time, that was one of the impressions I had. Actually, the, too big, too long. The quote I made, and uh, this isn't a total quote because it's it's obviously, uh, but I basically said, uh, this is I'll just read it from this, but I've also got it on tape so that I wouldn't misstate it. Mr. Maroon stated the applicant uh, needed to show why the property as it is today would not work and why a new structure is needed, thus providing more information for criteria one. Was one of my issues. I think you brought right. some of that information to the table. Uh, but I think the other issue that I also brought up, and I, I think I'll, I'll paraphrase, but like I said, I brought the tape of it so I, that I could play it exactly if necessary. I said, if this came back as a cape, I think you'd have absolutely no problem. You did say that. Uh, and I still stand by that position. I think no. the challenge is that it isn't a cape. It isn't consistent. And I think that's where you're... All of the other stuff becomes almost irrelevant to me because I think, in my opinion, it's overly done for what is re relevant to the, 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 again, we don't know how much percentage of area, when I talk area, I'm talking about living area, taxable area, these houses around them increased. I just don't know. I couldn't even guess. But I do know if I was the neighbor, and that's the only way I can judge most things. I try to put myself in the bar, the, the person that's buying the property or owns the property. I try to, I put myself in their place, and I put myself in the neighbor's places. And I go, how do I feel about it? I would not be a happy person. And well, so, and, and and so that triggers to me, which is subjective. But excuse me, ran out of diet moxie, believe it or not. Did you go guys go buy me a moxie or something? Um, <coughs> the uh, what it triggers for me is the ultimately subjective term, which is essential character of the locality, and that's subjective. And even if we could prove, number one, yeah, the, problem, the building's going to fall down, fine, I still think you come back to the subjectivity, and I tried just as hard as I could because I watched the first meeting and didn't like it. Um, I, I said, I, I think... This comes back as a cape with a dormer. I don't think you got a problem. Again, only speaking for me. <coughs> but when I look at that, that's the last thing in the world that is is a cape. And I'm not trying to shove the words of the rest of the board in here, but I'm worried about time. I am worried about, uh, we're coming up on 1030. I am worried about making sure we get you to get everything you want to say in. Okay. But I, but, and I don't want you to not say anything just because I'm speaking. But at the same time, I don't want you to lose the board's <coughs> attention in your message and get your message clouded with the stuff that we all go, yeah, okay. I, know I don't you think any of us have a problem with the front. I, don't well, think I know you mentioned last time, Mark, if it's a cape, you'd be okay. 
Yeah. There's not a cape on the whole street. Uh, that's not my point. You know, uh, well, well, that's, that's you know point. how you fit into the character of the street and the um, you're talking about. I'll give you an about. example. If, if you really want me to drive the point home, um, you actually showed one that I love. Uh, number three. Right. I, I understand. I like that house. Yeah. I'd expect a lot bigger than that on this, but I have no yeah. problem with that. Yeah. Um, number, number five. Before number the, the six. Ones. Number seven. Number eight's obviously no problem. Um, I think it, yeah, I'd even say number ten, possibly. Number the fourteen. I think number yep. 13 is too high, but I don't know what it started out as. Yep. Uh, number 15. Uh, number 16 is too big for me. Number 17 is too big for me. Number 18, debatable. So when I describe a cape, I don't mean... Uh, I, you couldn't build a cape if you okay. wanted to. <laughs> so, so when I... You know, when I think of your construction style, I don't expect a cape because I just, you're better than that. But that being said, when I think of impact, that's what my point was when I made that point. And, and I just, I'm worried that you're going to get us lost in the minutia and not on the bigger picture. And, and I don't want, so, so that, that's that. Again, and again, I, I speak as one person, but character to me is a huge issue. And again, I try to take myself and say, okay, I'm living across the street. I'm living beside people. I get the last one we just went through, right? Everybody said, whoa, we love it. Yeah. I get this one here, we're not going to get the same reaction. Well, see, when you talk character, I think maybe different than you. I, I, I distinguish you character from us, aesthetics. You are, I think you're you an artist. Them, I think you lump them together. You're an artist, <laughs> and, I, and I respect that. Art. That's one of the reasons I, I think you do. That's why I give you the accolades I do. I think you're an artist. But that being said, there's some art that's just too darn big for the wall. Well, we have to start out with the fact we have to elevate it because it's in the zone where we have to be elevated off the ground. But it's already three feet off the ground as it sits. Well, the existing houses. But the existing uh, heights are 28 foot, 26 foot, and just this one section at 30 foot above ground level. Right, but the well, existing, well existing below the is already... I'm not talking about... I'm not, again, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about taking character, and it's a, it's a subjective opinion. There's no measurement of character. It, and again, unless of course you're talking about how great a house you build, which I'll say all day long, a good character. But when you talk about the character of the neighborhood, does it? Do you drive by and if you're the neighbor, you're going, "Oh my gosh," or are you saying, "Hey, that really helps my property." You know, I like that. I, I'm encouraged by that. Like, and that's to me. And I, I don't want to speak for the board, and I would love to have the board jump in because I feel like I'm dominating, and I don't want to do that. Uh, but I also. I'm trying to focus us on the issues at hand. None of us, I think, have a disagreement with anything you've said. Right. If I could suggest uh, something that may work procedurally to do that, I know sure. there's some concern about a lot of the members of the public who spent way too much time here. I think we've presented the factual information that didn't have before that we wanted them to have a chance to respond to. Um, we had talked previously about perhaps having a question and answer. Maybe if we could, when we do the question and answer, if there's a way for Walt to weigh in as well as me on Absolutely. a particular answer, mm -hmm. we do that at that point, but now perhaps let the, um, the members of the public come up and talk to the board, has the information, and then we can go to deliberate. I just, I just want to confirm yep. that Walt feels he's got the information he needs to get out You're first all the information before we I need do that. Except one last little page mm -hmm. I got. Go ahead. These are other buildings in the locality close to and the proximity, and some maybe a little farther away, but in the locality of Higgins Beach. And you look at the size of these houses and stuff that are down there. These houses, combined with the houses on Vesper, <coughs> as well as some of the other houses down at Higgins Beach, all create an atmosphere down there that's conducive to the design of this house. Okay. The house we got is not in excess of everything down at Higgins Beach. And, and, and again, I, I thank you. And I, 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 that's the other question. Is what, 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 again, it's objective. What is neighborhood? What is locale? Right. Uh, locale to me is different than neighborhood. Locale is a very narrow window to me, whereas neighborhood is different. But that's good. Are you sure you got everything that you wanted to get out before yep. everybody speaks? Okay. So I'm assuming some people would like to speak. I am going to open the public hearing. If you'd like to speak, please get in line so that we can move it fairly long. I am going to read two into the record that I did get letters from. Did we get any phone calls? I did not. Mm, no, I had a, I had a visitor and then I had a letter. 
Yeah. Okay. So I'll read these two in. I'll open the public hearing on this just to make it official, and we'll go through. Uh, this is uh, my name is Philip McGoldrick, and my family has been an abiding property uh, owners at 21 Vesper Street for over 50 years. I registered our concerns out at your August and September meetings with the proposed structure of, at 19 Vesper Street. Fortunately or unfortunately, we were in Florida for the winter months. Uh, therefore, this email, uh, we would have no complaints if this were reasonable in the request and fit with the existing character of the neighborhood. We even stated that uh, when our neighbors came forth with the, their plans and asked for variances, we had no problem. Our buddy neighbor at 23 Vesper Street was within three feet of our property line, and we spoke in favor of this variance. We are trying to be good neighbors. We only wish they would extend the same courtesy. Rule one. We feel that this land can yield a reasonable return since the property owner sold it within one month of it being on the market for the asking price. Rule two, there has been several homes in the immediate neighborhood that have been approved by the board for renovations and fit with the character of the neighborhood. Rule three, we feel that with the granting of the variance will alter the character of the neighborhood with height and density. For some reason, they are adamant about having a third floor with a walk-up stairway. Because they haven't been honest with you, and I, I don't like that term, I will qualify that right up. Because they haven't been honest with you in several areas, we believe that after they are in the new house, that they will finish off the third floor as original plans showed. Um, I, I make no comment on that. We feel that the residents of Higgins Beach have made it abundantly clear at zoning board meetings at the clubhouse, and they don't want buildings that big on postage stamp size lots because they are out of character with the Higgins, with the original Higgins Beach. I also want to qualify that. That was in meetings regarding the future development plans which aren't in effect right now. Revised plans in September did not appear to reduce the coverage and that is why they were given a third <coughs> chance to comply with uh, <coughs> which they have not done even uh, though the boy was adamant about this and were willing to table it to give them another chance. Now they show up in November with basically the same plan, but with a law firm. Uh, uh, what don't they understand is that the zoning board and Higgins Beach residents don't want another old orchard. I would ask that the board deny the request. Uh, maybe in a year they will come back with a reasonable request that will fit the character of the neighborhood of Higgins Beach. And that was from um, Philip McGoldrick, 21 Vesper. The next is from 19 Vesper. Oh, I'm sorry, 37 Vesper. Uh, Philip LaRue, Jr. Good afternoon, Brian. I heard rumors of such with regards to replacing the two cottages on the above reference address and with a new structure. As you know, I am very in favor of improving the housing stock in the town of Scarborough. However, if the building is going to be out of character with the surrounding structures, then I have somewhat of a problem. For example, if the new building is going to be three stories when the vast majority of buildings in the location are only two stories, then I would have to submit my disapproval for such a variance to be allowed. Thank you for your time concerning this matter, and I trust your judgment in the final outcome. Sincerely, Philip LaRue, uh, Junior, 37 Vesper Street, Chicago. So those are the two written requests we had. If anybody would like to speak, please uh, stand up and state your name, address, and uh, your thoughts. Just line up behind the podium. We'd like to move it. If speak as long as you like, but we'd like to be able to move it along. I don't really want gaps in between. If you could state your name, address, that would be great. Yeah, I'm Scott Flaherty, part owner of 21 Vesper, and I also own one Greenwood Ave. Uh, start, I mean, starting at the beginning, I mean, when, I mean, when the, the property was sold and so forth like that, I did meet, I did meet the, the future, I mean, the owners of it and so forth like that. And we know, we actually know the same people, and. Uh, with friends of theirs and so forth like that. Well, you know, going by, and they, we knew they were tearing the place down. You know, and talking to people, they said, oh, yeah, it's just going to be a single floor, single floor, you know, structure. And I said, well, that'd be great. You know, and I knew the situation with their daughter. I mean, uh, you know, it's pretty common knowledge. Everyone knows it out there because it is a tight night. Well, so I had met the neighbors out there one day on a Saturday. <laughs> And I told him, I said, you know, I said, you know, this is when I was in the understanding that it was going to be a single level structure. I said, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're totally for you rebuilding it. It sounds great. You you have our support. 
Well, when the first prints came out, and you get online and you check, you know, they weren't very, it wasn't very detailed. It did show a little thing. There wasn't any prints like there are today, you know, you know, the last two times. And we got, you know, my brother-in-law happened to come go down to City Hall, and he got, and that's when we said, wow, they're going to build that house beside our house? I mean, and that's why we got involved. I mean, this is the first, actually the first time I'd been here. You know, uh, my brother-in-law has been here, but he's in Florida right now. So, a uh, couple that's points. That's, just, to, just to clarify, that's Mr. McGoldrick? Yes, he's, he is my brother-in-law. Oh, thank you. A couple points, okay. The house behind the house they want to build is, is I don't know the exact dimensions, but I, I mean, I tried to do it with tape, but it's, it's trespassing if I go out there, but it's not trespassing if the town does it, okay? <laughs> but it was 20 by 20, and it's 10 feet high. That's the house behind it. He's saying our house is 45 feet. Yes, it is 45 feet. That's where the that's where the nine foot garage, a little little garage. The house isn't 45 feet long though. It's got a little garage that you can't even put a car in. We put our we put our lawn chairs and stuff like that in it. So it is, and and it's 20 it's 22 feet wide. So it you know so and. The house beside us, I mean, I, I, I tried to get up here. I tried to run for the things. I mean, I thought, you know, that, you know maybe we should have had them ahead of time because I could You want to take one of those pictures and put them up? You, no, you that's fine. The, the, the lot that he's stating next door that he's saying there's 100 by 100 and they built a thing and it's going to be split. Is it going to be split? The guy's planting trees. I know the gentleman. He's, he's from Canada. He's got no intention of selling that lot. He's planting trees on it. So if you're going to sell a lot, I don't know why you'd be planting trees. So, I mean, I think we're misstating on a lot of things here uh, about what other people are going to do. I mean, and the ones that are two feet, from, two feet from the road, they've been there for 60 years, 70 years. That was probably when it was dirt roads. You know, I mean, you know, the... Uh, another one he's talking about is Philip LaRue, which is my wife's cousin. I mean, he's three feet from the road. He remodeled his house, but he never tore the front down and the side beside the house. That was the way he remodeled it. That was the old, I mean, this was before Brian came here. That you know, That was the only way he could do it, leave that wall there and leave the front. Other than that, he wasn't even going to get a permit, and that's what he left. Uh, my wife's aunt, she's on Vesper Street. She's within a foot from the line. So that's just the way it was built 50, 60, 80 years ago, whatever it was. So, I mean, and, and the other house, the, the house that he's talking about, three stories. I don't know if you, none of you board probably remember this, but there was a lawyer that lived in there. His name was Gagan. He was the one that started all the construction in Higgins Beach. He was the one that took Scarborough to court. And that's why he's three stories. He, he, brought, he brought Scarborough to court, and he won in Superior Court. And that's what transpired all the building out to Higgins Beach. By Mr. Uh, his name was Gagan. He was from Westbrook, and he was the one that started it. That's the three story on that road. Other than that, the houses that have been redone have been done in class. The one, the two across the street from us, the one beside us, actually, in in the in Larue, the Larue, uh, he he, you know, he didn't he didn't go up three stories. He just went up two, you know, two stories. And that's all we're we we are against them building. We're not against them building a good sized house. You know, I mean, I don't expect them to build a twenty by forty house like ours is. But I, I mean, thirty one by sixty seven. Them are the, you know, I mean, no, it's not all 31, but there's 31 feet on a 50-foot lot, 50 foot by 100. So, you know, I mean, that's a gigantic house. It's a house, it's a lot that, I mean, it's a house that isn't going to be in that neighborhood. I mean, if, I, I don't know if any of you guys, people have been out there to see where this house is going and seen the houses, the four houses that are beside this. It just doesn't go with it. So, I got nothing else I can say. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, 
Uh, my name's Llewellyn McGoldrick. I'm the younger brother of the one you have the letter from. And you look younger. <laughs> <laughs> my sister is younger than I am, as you'll probably find out. She looks younger, out. too. <laughs> I never really considered living at Higgins Beach ever to be any kind of a hardship. It was an awesome place to grow up. I, my parents must have known how much I was going to like it because they bought it the year I was born, or the second year. And so we spent our childhood at Higgins Beach, which was mostly back then seasonal summer cottages, where I had all kinds of friends from all over the country who would come for two or three weeks. We were fortunate. We lived there. We didn't even own a house, but we had a cottage at Higgins Beach, which was kind of a unique situation. <laughs> and I want to say that I appreciate the board's uh, follow-through with this. I really do. I, I think you are concerned about the neighborhood and how something fits in. Not in the sense of dimensions necessarily, but if you drew scales, models of the places, and set this one, the proposed, next to where the neighbors are, it would be more telling than trying to visualize uh, a kind of a square foot situation. And basically, I agree with uh, everything that my brother has said. And uh, we are three owners. Uh, we inherited the property. And uh, it's just a great place to be. We never had any trouble with other neighbors. They talked to us. They came to us. We even came and spoke in favor of what they were doing. Uh, but this one, we never heard a word. We had to do all the tracking ourselves. Nobody ever approached us and told us exactly what they were going to do. It started out as a one story, I guess. I didn't hear that, but my brother-in-law did. So anyway, I just want to say I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I appreciate your diligence in making sure the right thing's done. Thank you. Thank you. I'm about to close the public hearing unless somebody wants to get up. Oh, you got movement. We got the third. Okay. That's the way to do it. Okay. I'm Elizabeth McGoldrick Flaherty. I'm the youngest and And by far the youngest looking. Thank you. I was waiting for that. <laughs> um just wanna sum everything up and say that the reason we're here is because this proposed house is so out of character with the best of street neighborhood. It's simple. You go on to Vespa Street and you look at the houses, and then you take a look at this house that's being proposed. Uh, people are going to say, it sticks out like a sore thumb. I mean, it just does not fit. It's going to be overwhelming. And I worry about the fire danger to our house. If this house catches on fire, we wouldn't stand a chance. It would be so close to our house. So that's another consideration. Um, yes, there's been mistakes in the past, which I am so glad that the board is trying to correct. Just because one huge house was built doesn't mean that we have to turn Higgins Beach into let's compete and see who can be build the biggest house. And... Uh, I think if this, this house passes, there'll be a lot of hard feelings, a lot of people saying, how did the zoning board ever approve a house that sticks out like this? Let's not let this happen at Higgins Beach. Um, I guess that's all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Very much. I'm Mary Ann McGoldrick, and I'm married to the tall guy. Uh, and I, I think to myself, when I look at the numbers, the 67 feet deep, 67 feet on a 100-foot lot, and I think of the house that's in the backyard that's 12 feet tall, I, I think that's a pretty imposing position for that neighbor in behind, and then us with the house as close as it is, and it's... 30-odd 30, 30 feet high, that's in the wall. The, the just, just, I just, it's, I, it's like standing in front of a drive-in theater screen. And, and that's, that's your view outside of your home. And, and you're used to the smallness. That's the, 
you know, 20 by 40 isn't very big. And it, it's just a little, I would call it overwhelming. And the idea of maximum return for the money, I mean, obviously, there's, they, this is uh, an investment w with uh, a sizable expectant return at some point. But that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. This is Mark Pauley. I live at 15 Kelly Lane. Um, I've known the Daytons for a few years now, and I'm uh, well aware of their family dynamic. And uh, having sat here for most of the evening, I, I'm, I'm sorry about a lot of things, but I'm not sorry that I'm not on this board. Uh, <laughs> uh, it seems like you've got your work cut out for you, but you, you put a board like this together to be able to operate in the gray. I, I think any of us can do black and white. Uh, the gray is where, is, is where the talent comes in. Uh, so I, I would certainly, uh, certainly encourage you, uh, based on everything we've heard tonight, I've heard a lot of what doesn't work, but I haven't heard a lot of what will work. And, and I, I think that's, that's the way you have to operate in this particular arena. And, and as, we, as I call the gray, uh, find out what will work. Uh, it's 67 feet long, and that doesn't work for some people. Would 63 feet work? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, um, that's that's certainly our job, and I'm not and I'm and I'm not here to tell you how to do it. But as a resident of Higgins Beach, I can tell you there's a lot of different buildings going on down there, and they, we all talk about the character. First of all, I love living at Higgins Beach. We all talk about the character of Higgins Beach, but it seems to me everything that's built is markedly different from the last thing that was built. I don't see I don't see any continuity down there, nor do I think we would want continuity down there. It would be nothing more than a, than, than a, a bunch of barracks if uh, uh, we did something like that. So uh, I'll just close in saying that due to their family dynamic and due to the fact that I'm also a resident of Higgins Beach, I would encourage you to try to do something to make this work for them and, and not focus so much on what doesn't work, but focus more on what will work. Thank you. Mr. Tully, before you go, can, can you help me clarify? I, I can't tell whether or not you're for the design or not for the design. I'm for the ability to, to do what works and taking in all the different criteria that happens. Higgins Beach was built a long time ago. I came into it, uh, <coughs> obviously, uh, uh, being old. I'm not that old. So, so Higgins Beach was well developed by the time I got there, but there was a lot of inadequate things that were done there, and I don't know that you can apply a black and white rule to fixing everything down there. You've got two cottages on a, on a, on a 50 by 100 lot. Uh, it, it, it doesn't conform to much. So, so, so I, I, would, I would be in favor of, of trying to accommodate the Daytons and, and using all the ability that you have and all the creativity you have and all the innovation you have to try to make something work down there because Higgins Beach isn't, uh, uh, is, is anything but a perfect place in terms of lot size and building design. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to tie back to what Mr. Pauly said in the role of the board, um, his points are, are accurate, and I like those, that concept. The, the reality is that our job is to take what somebody prevent, presents to us, and we have actually got stung by trying to help. This may just be one of those cases. Um, so one of the challenges we have, Mr. Pauly, and just generally anybody in, in the public, is it's not, and I'm, I'm going to say this where it sounds cold and harsh, and I don't mean it that way, but I'll just say it as from, a, from more of a legal tense. Um, it's not our job to come back with something that they, that they can approve or they like. It's their job to something that we can approve. That being said, as I think anybody that's spent 10 minutes watching us knows we're going to do everything we can do to help foster a functional devel uh, development. Uh, but it is a gray area, and we have been stung before by trying to help too much. And like I said, this may, in fact, be one, another one of those. Uh, and so that's just for informational point of view, what we can't, I'm trying to give you an idea of what we can and can't do. Uh, that's all I'm saying with that. Do you want to speak? My name is, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Michelle Dayton, and I am the prospective <coughs> owner, uh, the prospective builder, actually. Um, <coughs> I apologize to those people who I guess I, we must have offended because our intention was never to make something massive. Our intention was to buy two cottages to be able to 
create a living space for my daughter to live independently, although still under our watch. She no longer cooks for herself. She barely ever drives. She needs somebody to watch her. And the only reason we bought those two cottages was so that we were told that you could combine them and she would be able to live independently in an accessory apartment attached to our home. I have grown up going to Hagen's Beach my entire life. I had an aunt that lived on Houghton Street. My sister just rebuilt her house on Greenwood. Our friend Teddy lives across from her. We know Tom Murphy very well. We live right behind him on Kelly Lane. And they could tell you if you ask them what kind of people we are. Bonnie, is, Bonnie and Mark are our neighbors right now, and we live in a duplex. It is not enough open space or personal space for my husband and I who live separately all week long. And he, see, he drives up from New York every Friday and drives back to New York every Sunday so we can spend some quality time together. Otherwise, I am up here by myself with my daughter. So I had no intention of hurting anybody's feelings or offending because that's not who we are. And if you knew us better, you would know that. I never said a word, my husband never said a word about making a one-story home. I don't know where that conversation came from, whether it was hearsay. Higgins Beach is a small community. And I'm a very private person. I don't share a lot about my family because, quite frankly, it's nobody else's business but mine. But because we're in this forum right now, and I feel like this is the third time we have tried to get things done, I feel like we have spent more money than we would ever have imagined to adjust plans Yes, it's going to look like a big house. The main part of our house is three bedrooms on the second floor, and we have no intention of putting a dormer with a third floor on the way things are right now. I have two other daughters. I have three grandchildren. I have a sister from California who's married and has two children. They all like... So it is not a massive house by any stretch. It may look massive because Nicole's space, which by the way is less than the mandatory 750 square feet, or I guess the minimum, I should say not mandatory, but the minimum square footage, I think is 750 square feet. And I, Walter, I don't remember exactly, but it was like 600 and something, right, for Nicole? It's a basic one bedroom. It's sort of like a loft, a small kitchen area and a living area and a bathroom on each floor. Half a bathroom on the first floor because she was run over by a truck at Whole Foods when she worked there many years ago and she doesn't, she's not, she doesn't have a great knee. So we are just trying to do the best we can for our family and this is the reason why we have tried to adjust and adjust and adjust. I don't want a porch with the new rules. I don't want a cape and I know your suggestion of a cape is meaning a smaller condensed home, not so massive, not so big, not so high. I know that Higgins Beach is going to change, and whether people like it or not, change is inevitable everywhere you go. I myself can tell you the last few years of my life I've had the most change in 59 years. So I am just asking you to please, please consider it, because if we don't find a piece of property at Higgins Beach to retire to with my daughter. We're going to put the houses up for sale. And I told myself I was not going to do this. Dana, I'm sorry. It's, uh, take, a, take a deep breath. And, uh, I had a whole thing written, Phil, which take your, it's right take, out the window. It doesn't matter because I'm basically I have... Take, take a deep breath. It's okay. Uh, do you have a, this is an emotional thing. And there are two of us on this board that are dealing with another issue just like this on our own street in Naples. So trust us, we know more than what you think we know. We get it. We know the emotion. It's real. It's legitimate. But the problem is we want to live at Higgins Beach because of my family history. And there's not ever going to be a lot at Higgins Beach that will accommodate. Um, can I ask a blunt question? What were they? What did they tell you about the property when you bought it? We were told that because of the, the footprint of the two cottages and that there was two cottages present on the property, that we would be grandfathered in and would, we would be able to build an accessory apartment attached to the back of our home. That was our intention. We, re we bought that house, that property. I think we made an offer before it even hit the market. 
because they, they, I have been the, scoping was, around did, for so long. Did the owners tell you that? We had a realtor. Realtor told us that. A local realtor that deals with specifically only Higgins Beach homes. We had spoken to Walter about the potential, and he said it was a great prospect for us because it had the two cottages, and it had the we would be able to be grandfathered in to be able to take those two um, and combine them to be able to. I don't know all the technical terms because I'm a retired art teacher. I retired in January 1st of this year to take care of my daughter up here. So, um, you know, maybe we were misled. I don't know. I can only tell you that we bought what we bought because we thought this was going to be the best solution for our family. Were, were you told that it would definitely be something that could be? Yes. Uh, you weren't told it was a probability. You were told that it was We were told be it was definitely going to be able to be built on the property with an accessory apartment attached to the back of our home. So we paid full price for the property. We tried to negotiate. The owner said they wouldn't accept anything other than full price. So my husband was like, fine. We offered less. They wouldn't accept it. And we thought that was going to be our only chance because it's on level land. Some of the properties at Higgins Beach have a slope in the backyard. So... You'd have an issue with, you know, um, the bathroom situation, your your sewage being pumped up to be able to be pumped out to the street for sewers. And, I mean, we we have been looking seriously for two years. So the minute I saw the surveyors, anybody will tell you on our street, on Kelly Lane, that I walk the beach every single day with the exception of the last couple of weeks because we've had a lot going on. My daughter from Annapolis, Maryland, had gotten a, uh, her husband got a hardship transfer to move up here. So I spent eight days with my oldest daughter, who is 33, and my two grandchildren looking for schools for them to go to, looking for homes for them to buy so they can be close by, so my husband can, and I can do things together again. Was it just the realtor that told you it was indefinite? Or? No, it was n no. I had asked Walter, and Walter had suggested the property was a good choice. And I'm hoping I'm not throwing him under the bus because this, this is, we have a very good rapport with Walter. And, you know, I just, I feel like all the houses at Higgins Beach, you have to find something that has a cottage. And most of the ones that we had seen that had cottages were never for sale. It was always the single family homes that were not big enough to accommodate. And then we closed on our house May 1st. The two sisters that owned those houses loved those cottages with all their heart. And I cried at the closing because I felt like I was going to be, I was ter I knew we were going to try and repurpose them so that maybe somebody else would be able to move them off the property to be able to use them in a different way. So I started crying at the closing, and I've had four people at the cottages to try and move them, but they said it would cost about $15,000 per cottage to move them to another location. And truthfully, the back one, thank you, the back one is not sturdy enough. I'm about 98 pounds. And when I walk on the upstairs floor, the whole thing springs up and down. And they look adorable from the outside, and it breaks my heart to have to move them. But if we get the opportunity to do this, I would have no other choice because I've tried every path. I've talked to every person I come in contact with, the insurance man, the, our handyman. I mean, it's been an endless amount of people to try and move them so we wouldn't have to destroy them. I'm all about repurposing. I'm all about recycling. I'm all about using things in a better way. But truthfully, there's no way we could keep those cottages and be able to use them to rebuild, reconstruct, redo them. It just would not work. I think the back one, actually, I was told was moved there, and it used to be a fishing cottage of some sort. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but the what I was told. It's possible, I guess. So that is my story. And if I've hurt anybody, I, you know, I apologize, but that was not our intent. I'm sure it wasn't. And the, everything in Higgins Beach is a challenge. This is not, not a new process uh, for us to have to deal with. The, the trouble for us is meeting the requirements of the four criteria. And we try to do it the best we can based on the realities we're put in. Um, I don't know what's going to happen next. I, 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 I have an idea how to that I'll throw out a little bit later on. But right now, I, I guess we'll, anybody else wish to speak from the public? Can I, can I just say, I don't 
I get, uh, sir, if you could go back up to the podium. You're okay right? coming up to speak if you'd like, but you just need to state your name again and address. And uh, you did a nice job speaking, ma'am. We're not. I mean, we're not against some building. And 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 uh, and what 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 it is uh, point to us is that third floor. If there's a fire there, the fire department isn't going to say there's a two and a half story structure. They're going to say it's a three story structure. I mean, if if they're looking to do something, I, I mean. And we're going to be pushing for a vote today. I mean, you know, we don't want this tabled again, so it's going to have to be a vote. So what I'm, I mean, if they, you know, if if they're willing to move off that two and a half foot story and maybe knock 80 square feet off that house and bring it to 1,600 square feet instead of almost 1,700, I mean, we're we're not opposed to them building. But what I mean, we are opposed to the structure that's sitting there now. And if she, I mean, I felt bad for her up here talking. I mean, I know she wants to live there, but we all, you know, we want to be good neighbors, but we also, we, all, we want to see the sun too sometimes during the day. With that structure there, you're not going to see the sun. So. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Once? Twice? Yes. yes. Okay, go ahead. We can't. We can't hear you. So go ahead. Just a quick question. If you could do me a favor again, state What's your name and address. What's the height of the? Ma'am, could you do me a favor and just again state your name and address? Oh, Marianne McGoldrick. What's the height of the ceilings in each floor? Are they seven six? Are they eight feet? Are they nine and a half feet? What What's the height from the floor to the top of the ceiling? Roughly, how rough? As you must know. Okay. Okay. So height, you can't, you can't shrink the, the size of the room for the height. Mm -hmm. No. No. You you can't. I was thinking if they were like nine feet, if they were nine foot ceilings or something like that, you could drop the ceiling. But good question. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Anybody else wish to speak? Once, twice. Public oh, hearing is closed. Okay, so let's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Callum. What I'd like to do, if the board is comfortable, is take a five-minute break, because I'm sure some of us could use a restroom break. That'd be good. And uh, if you want to continue through, let's go, at least go one board member that has to leave. Um, what's the board's desire? 1030 would typically... Um, I, I'm, I'm willing to go the whole way. Yeah, I have, I have a lot of points, and I certainly feel bad for Mrs. Dayton, but I had, well, anyways, my, my point is, can we get a, a vibe of how the board feels? Having heard everything we have, we've heard, don't we sometimes take a pulse to see where we stand and if, give the folks a chance to either table it or go to vote? Because I, I think we have some, huh? We've, 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 we've tabled twice. Tabled. I, I have a suggestion that I, I, I can kind of, sense the whole process of where this is going. Um, but a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is we have not addressed any of the issues that you've brought up in this, email, this letter. And by law, we need to do that. Uh, there's, some, there's a lot of information in here that we need to address before we could take a vote in any event, because they, they're owed that. It's also part of the requirements of our procedures. Otherwise, to be candid with you, it immediately allows for an appeal. And I don't have any desire to go to court, and I don't have any desire for the town to spend any more money, and I certainly don't have a desire for them to spend any more money. So, that being said, that's one issue. The other issue is that the question of whether or not a new model coming back, if this were declined, a new model coming back more in line with what we're talking about, I think passes a straight face test of not having to wait a year. That's my personal opinion. That's a judgment call on the board. So eventually, if we got to the point where this were going to be declined, uh, my preference would be to say that if this came back with a percentage lower, I would not hold them to the one-year waiting period. But we have to deal with what's on our table. We can't redesign this here. 
so there are a lot of moving parts. Um, the, the good news is that Mr. Uh, Mr. Callum has a, has a lot more control over this than we do, uh, as it's his letter. So uh, why don't we, Mr. Callum, if you'd like to continue, how you'd like to present, how you'd like to proceed. Uh, my thoughts are if we're going to continue, we need to continue all the way and then vote up or down. Um, but that needs to be a complete process. If um, you would prefer a different option, I'm more than willing to entertain it, and we can talk about it amongst the board. Uh, from what I heard, uh, at, le at least uh, what I think I heard, is that um, there isn't a lot of movement on the behalf of uh, the Daytons to change the design line. Um, and if that's the case, um, the reality is they need to need to do exactly what she said, which is sell it and find something else. This just may be too small of a lot to do what you want to do. And, and that just may be the reality of the lot, if it goes the way it goes. If it goes past, then the neighbors will need to deal with it as it plays out. There are no good answers in this equation. That there's just no good answers, and if both sides are saying, this is where I sit, and if we're trying to make decisions based on, and remember, we're basing our decisions on the four criteria as they stand with the current regulations in place. And just to clarify something that was said, and I wanted, it wasn't said today, but it was said at the last meeting, at no point did, did uh, Mr. Longstaff ever say that we would be applying these new rules to this project. He said it may behoove you to wait to see if the new rules would make it easier for you because he was had enough wisdom to recognize this didn't have much of a shot. If I'm putting words in your mouth, please correct me. You're always putting words in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but my understanding is that uh, what I heard, what I understood is that at no point does this board have any desire to look, I don't even know. I haven't read the rules. I never went to one of the meetings, so uh, I couldn't tell you what they are anyway. I was involved in that discussion. I can bring it up when it's the right time. Okay. So, Mr. Callan, how would you like to proceed at this point? So, I know that you're saying that I have more control than you, but I just respectfully say you are in control and that it's after 1040. And, I, you know, I think w what we did hope is that we would get to a point where we would have a vote today. Um, and I think that the, the neighbors, you know, although it was several people speaking, it was essentially it's one neighboring lot that has multiple owners, mm -hmm. and they would appreciate that too. Um, and so it would be our preference, if possible, to get to a vote today, but I, I am also aware that it's well after 1030, and I don't have the ability to keep you here. And if, um, if there are questions that you need answered, then I want to make sure I have the opportunity to answer that. So that is a little bit out, outside of my control. I, I hope I've given you enough guidance in terms of what I'm looking for. Um, if I'll give just a little bit more to the extent you guys can make a decision on what makes sense. I am happy um, as an, an attorney to say that I don't need to. I know you have a practice sometimes of having people read their letter into the record. I, I trust that everyone here has read this letter and has considered it, and, and I would be fine with um, the not having me go through and read all of these things, but I also don't want to say, you know, that the kind of understanding we had in terms of going and having the public speak was that we would get the chance to answer the board and address the specific criteria, and I do want the opportunity to address that with the board, and so if that can't be done tonight, then you know, the hour is what it is, and that's a decision mm -hmm. that, that you all need to be make, need to make. So we're not, we wouldn't ask for it to be tabled. We're, this is the proposal that we're asking you to vote on. We don't want an opportunity to okay. change it one more time. Okay. Um, although we would appreciate, as you said, if, if you are going to, um, if you are going to deny it, it would help to put something on the record for the applicant as to what would or wouldn't meet a standard for coming back with a new application. Um, so all of those things are to say, yes, I would prefer that you vote tonight, 
Um, I don't feel the need to read the letter. I do feel like I need to address some specific questions of the board, and I'm not confident we have time to do that. And I leave that to you um, as the board and, and the hour that we have. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to take a five-minute recess uh, but, and uh, come back if that's okay with the rest of the Yeah, uh, and Mr. Chairman, if I could, uh, the, the bylaws basically say no new business after 10 o'clock. Yeah. Um, I think there's every, I think they have every right to expect that we carry this through. I know one member has to leave uh, for family reasons. That we still have a quorum here. Correct. So I would, <laughs> believe me, I don't want to stay here anymore. <laughs> I've been here all day. <laughs> uh, but but, uh, and that's not actually true. I haven't been here all day. But I, I think we ought to we ought to plow through. Can we get overtime? Right? And, and uh, no, we don't. <laughs> so so I think everybody has the expectation that they'd like to have a vote. And my suggestion is that yeah, you know, we all do what we have to do. But if we can stay and finish this, that's what we should do. In, in order to do that, it requires, even though I appreciate uh, the, the comments about not reading it in, we have to, uh, as far as my understanding, go through each one of these issues and give you the courtesy of addressing that. He just that. has to respond. He doesn't have to read yeah, it. We, we don't have to read it in, but I, we, I want to make sure that every issue that you bring forward has been addressed, maybe not to your satisfaction, but been addressed. Um, and okay. so I think if that's the case and the board is still breathing. Can you quiz us and see if we want to do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, yes. I'm in agreement. I am as well. I agree. Mr. Crocker, we know you have to leave, so we get it. <coughs> Can we make a real quick break? Can you be back here at 11.05? Okay, yes. Yep. Okay, do I have a motion to break for 11.05? Motion. Second. Okay. All in favor? Unanimous break for four minutes. Thank you. <laughs>